the video, we see the ship, we see that when it did hit the bridge that the looks like the power went out on, went on out. the on the vehicle. And now we want to check back in with Mike Helgren, who is live in Baltimore County, speaking with folks who have seen and, and heard all this happen this morning. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. And that is something that we had heard, and I was look, keep looking at these videos, and it, it looked like the ship lost power before the collision with the bridge. And it's so incredible how fast everything happened. I mean, just in about 10, 15 seconds. Uh, and there were vehicles on the bridge, and some of the uh, challenges that rescue crews face right now are, well, the darkness, the cold water temperatures, the cold air temperatures, and also the silt in the water, that there's not a lot of visibility if someone is in the water and trapped there, very dark conditions, low visibility in the water, cold conditions. A again, we've been telling you how rescuers train for this, how that they go through intensive training for situations just like this, disasters just like this. However, you know, in these real world situations, uh, it, it is going to be extraordinary difficult and we know that there are likely people who went into the water and we've been telling you how those rescue efforts are paramount right now uh, as for the ship the dolly we know that it made stops in New York and Norfolk and uh, it was also in Panama recently uh, don't know a whole lot about the ship at this point and we don't know exactly uh, what those operating the ship experienced hopefully Hopefully that will come out in the coming hours, but it could be a long time uh, before we find out exactly uh, what led the ship just to, to hit the, bay, uh, the key bridge at that exact spot that just caused it. I mean, just incredible. Again, I know most people have seen the video, but just how fast this all happened. And right now, um, we're looking, again, we're in Baltimore County uh, near the port, but we're looking across there and there are several uh, you can see the, the flashing lights of the rescue crews. This uh, could take many hours because they're not going to give up until they determine that, that there's no more survivors there. So uh, this is a, an incredible rescue effort. We heard that there are out-of-state crews here as well. Someone was telling me at the boat dock uh, over on the other side of Turner Station, they saw a rescue crew from Delaware. I know we mentioned Harford County. They saw uh, a rescue crew from Harford County there as well. Um, so this whole area is, you know, with the with the Patapsco River and there's there's a number of tributaries and so there's a lot of water around here. So from one end of this neighborhood to the other, uh, there you can kind of get clo as, as close as we can uh, to the situation here. Uh, I think a lot of people are just in shock waking up to this news. Just incredible that something like this could happen. Uh, this 1.6 mile span that opened in 1977. So we're very close to the, uh, I, I believe it opened in March of 1977. Uh, so 47 years ago, uh, it's been a part of so many lives. And so people also, I think it's important to get to the bottom of exactly what caused this and, and how this unfolded. That uh, you think about a structure like that, Mike, and uh, you said it's 47 years old. We have bridges in America that are much, much older than that. Right. And, of course, this uh, one being an important part of the lives of so many people down there in Turner Station, uh, Sollers Point, uh, and Hawkins Point, uh, and uh, not to mention the fact that uh, some uh, trucks carrying cargo cross that bridge on a routine basis. Right. Uh, and so now this is uh, bringing so much of what we know as normal to a complete halt. And when you think about the scale of the bridge and, and this vessel taking it down, I'm seeing now that the scale of this ship, we're talking about 1,000 feet long, 150 feet wide. As you mentioned, that's substantial. That is a Sweet. substantial ship. And so... It could not stop immediately. So, right. uh, and the fact that we, we kept hearing that uh, power went out on the, on the ship, I mean, there's vir virtually nothing you can do, I guess, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, we're going to continue now with our live reporting here. Uh, Mike, we're going to bring you back in for just a moment. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you have seen uh, or actually covered bridge collapses before in your past. Does this one even compare to what you've seen in the past? Or, and how does it compare to other major news stories that you've covered? 
I mean, this is really one of the bigger ones that we have had in Baltimore, especially when it comes to infrastructure and the impact of this. I, I would say, and, 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 you know, it, at least it was very early in the morning because if it were rush hour for a few hours later, we would have had so many more vehicles on that bridge. Uh, and as you know, Vic, we have been talking to people out here who were jolted awake by the collision, and we want to hear uh, from some of them. Let's hear what they had to say about how this woke them up, people who live here near the Key Bridge. Yes, I heard a lot of fire equipment, uh, a lot of police, seeing a lot of police boats going out and see a lot of fire equipment underneath the bridge. It's just unbelievable, unbelievable. Can't believe it's going. It felt literally when I walked down here, I was like, what the heck? It feels different walking down here now. And that first gentleman uh, has lived here for 57 years. He said it's just incredible to think of this area without the key bridge. I mean, he was here before it was built, and now, uh, unfortunately, he's here when it's gone. So a lot of questions to be answered uh, right now about how this all unfolded, but that rescue effort is the main priority, and we can see that it is still going on just across the Patapsco from us and will be for some time until the uh, crews can make sure that they've gotten out anyone who could have possibly survived. And it, it looked like there was a tractor trailer that had, was just crossing the bridge. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you look at that video, and again, it's heartbreaking to watch, but there were, there were vehicles there. Uh, and also we're hearing reports of uh, a work crew, uh, and there may have been several members of that work crew who are unaccounted for. We'll know more when we get the official press briefing sometime later this morning. Thank you very much, Mike Helgren, down uh, at the uh, scene of this terrible situation. Mike is in an area where there are a few houses, uh, and uh, most of the area, of course, obviously is industrial, but the people who lived in that area, all of them telling the very same story about how they heard this loud boom right. uh, about 1.30 this morning. Some of them had no idea what it was, went back to sleep, and uh, then very soon were awakened by calls from friends and family asking if they're okay, right. uh, learning the news about the uh, the collapse of the bridge. We're going to go now to our chopper video, as you can see right there, uh, and uh, there is the devastating story right there. The, the, the ship below and pieces of the struts from the uh, uh, the bridge itself down on top of the uh, the actual boat. Yeah, we can see it laying there. As you mentioned, you can see the containers on the ship, this Dolly, uh, a Singaporean-based ship that we know was uh, headed to Sri Lanka eventually, had made several stops along the way, but out of coming, head, heading out of the port of Baltimore there and then crashing into the, into the Francis uh, Scott Key Bridge. It's just incredible. It's just incredible to see the actual huge chunk of bridge laying on this vessel there. Absolutely. Think about how much more devastating it's going to be to see once the sun rises. And I think Meg told us about 629, the, the sun should be uh, rising here this morning. Uh, and, of course, that will give a tremendous advantage to the people who are there working in the water uh, and those who are trying to, to figure out exactly what happened. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. WJC, of course, has been on top of the story since it first happened this morning. Let's recap exactly what occurred. 1.30 this morning, uh, a cargo ship named the Dolly with the Singapore registry struck a pylon of the bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and within seconds, the entire bridge had just completely collapsed. There you see uh, the ship um, stationary. Uh, we understand that it may have lost power just prior to the actual crashing into the bridge. Uh, we understand there may be as many as 20 people who uh, are in the water. Rescue crews from all around uh, Maryland are responding right now. Many of them are already on the scene, already in the water, performing search and rescue. Yeah, even though every time we play this video, I keep trying to look closely to see if we can see vehicles on the time of, at the bridge on the time of collapse. I can't see them in this, in this video, but we do understand there were several vehicles, including possibly a tow truck, on that bridge when it collapsed. And, and that's how we're ending up at this stage of a massive search and rescue, looking for all the people who could have possibly been in those vehicles. And uh, 
as we said, emergency crews responding to the scene right now. Uh, the water temperature is still relatively cold. Yes, very. Uh, so Im imagine these these rescue brave rescue workers who are diving in, doing what they can, trying to find uh, the people who may be lost there in the water. And as you mentioned, there are resources from across the state. Every county imaginable is now participating in the search and rescue of at least 20 people in this water. I mean, we keep playing this video just because it's so real. It's what's filling people's social media feeds this morning. I mean, you you just can't look at it enough. It's it's un, unimaginable. Yes, yeah, so and we saw a tweet earlier from uh, Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg, who is offering resources from the federal government, obviously, uh, to uh, this situation to help out in any way it's possible. Uh, what is heartwarming is the, the the number of people who have come together, not just the federal agencies, but the people who live around uh, this area and see this bridge every single day. One man, very emotional, that we talked to earlier this morning, uh, saying that he's praying for everyone who is involved here. Uh, tears in his eyes, saying that he was on his way to church to light a candle. Yeah, this is a very, very emotional moment, a very emotional morning. Everybody who's been impacted, I mean, you heard that one man say, you can't go back to sleep. It's it's now it's now ruling your consciousness for the day. It's, it's incredible. Most definitely. Word spread very, very quickly about this uh, across the United States uh, of what had occurred. Uh, I may have mentioned to you that uh, a producer out in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, uh, sent me a text message early this morning mm -hmm. saying that he'd seen this video and was pretty well uh, devastated by seeing it himself. And as we mentioned, this is a massive, massive impact also to uh, the commute in the region. Alexis mentioned 31,000 vehicles travel this bridge every day. So we know that this is going to be quite an impact as far as even just getting around the entire region today. Yeah. Yes. Let's go back to Mike Helgren, who is live there on the scene. He's uh, been with us here for about an hour or so. Uh, Mike, uh, what are you seeing and hearing right now? Well, we can talk a little bit more about the path of the dolly, that large ship that struck the key bridge. And it started uh, about a half hour before that collision here at the port of Baltimore. So uh, you can see the port is just right there, right next to me. And then the, the dolly went into the water and the key bridge, and I know it's very dark here, but the key bridge would just be about there in the middle of the water, not there right now. Um, it, it struck the pier, the support pier, and then the bridge collapsed. Now, uh, we understand the ship was on its way to Sri Lanka. It was going to be a 27-day journey. Um, we're, we're hearing reports that there were not injuries on the ship, so I'm sure uh, the captain, any support staff, that you know they're being interviewed as part of this investigation. Uh, something else important to point out was just again talking about how massive the bridge is I mean this took five years to construct the equivalent of more than 700 million dollars was the cost of the key bridge so you know replacing this big piece of infrastructure and I know that's not the priority right now but that is that could take a very long time uh, and, and the key bridge uh, was used to transport a number of uh, hazardous chemicals that uh, could not be taken through the tunnels in Baltimore. So this will impact, uh, you know, uh, transportation, uh, truck transportation up and down the East Coast, just the magnitude of this. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how long it could take to even reconstruct this, but it took five years in the 70s uh, to construct the bridge in the first place and a, and a big uh, cost as well. And you mentioned the Transportation Secretary Buttigieg has said, you know, that the federal government is standing by to help in any way possible. We know that they're already providing rescue assistance and we're seeing state and local officials as well. Um, you know, again, the rescue being the priority here, but there are a lot of moving parts here and a lot of big questions ahead. Mike, let's talk for just a moment about the importance of the Port of Baltimore. Uh, we know that this is a major part of the economy uh, for the state of Maryland as well as for the city of Baltimore. $3.3 billion in personal income generated through the port, 15,330 jobs. Uh, we're talking about a lot of people who are going to be affected by this. Certainly. And, uh, you know, the, the investigation, of course, is going to look at exactly what went wrong on that ship. But right now, yeah, the, the ship traffic, 
I mean, you know, they've got the, the rescue effort underway. So we don't know, you know, also the, the large girders from that bridge that collapsed. I mean, uh, all of that is going to be part of the investigation. It's going to take a while to get that out of the water. And so there's, there, there are a lot of, uh, of moving parts going forward. And, and you mentioned just the importance of the Port of Baltimore. Uh, also, you know, there are more than 11 million cars that cross the key bridge every year. So that's also a major artery, uh, a major hub for truck transport. And again, as we were mentioning, the hazardous chemicals that can't go through the tunnels have to go across the key bridge, and they're going to have to find alternate routes of transport up and down the East Coast. Mike, you showed us all the neighbors who were sort of just standing, watching, taking this in. Does this seem to be sinking in? Are, talk to us about how people are processing this. It's just so unimaginable, as we've been saying all morning. Yeah, I know some people uh, did not want to go on camera just because, you know, it's early in the morning. They're still a bit in shock. But I can tell you, it, it really is shock that uh, that this actually happened. Like, it, it's just unbelievable. I tell you, when I first saw the video, I, I just, I, it's almost like you can't believe that it's real, what happened. But but it, it happened so quickly. And um, as we've been telling you, a lot of people just heard and felt the sound of that collision, especially so close here, like an earthquake, they've described it. And so they were jolted out of bed. And now, you know, then they look on social media and they see the videos and that's just almost unbelievable. This will, Mike, obviously this will also change people's perspective when they do cross a bridge. We take them for granted. Yes. You know, they're be beautiful. We love seeing the water and everything, but we sometimes uh, don't think about the safety uh, of, of bridges uh, as well as uh, the fact that they are vulnerable. I mean, Absolutely. We're, and we're a coastal region. We have bridges all around. All over the place. Yeah, just incredible to think just exactly where that hit, that that was enough to collapse the structure. And I know that there are, you know, safety guidelines and, 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 and they're built to withstand some impact. Uh, so I'm sure that's going to be looked at as far as the infrastructure and, and whether, you know, there were any issues with the bridge. But, you know, obviously when you have a ship that large and it hits in that exact spot, I mean, it just went so fast. Uh, you know, and, and I, I did read that the that the bridge is 183 feet off the surface of the water, uh, 183 feet high at its highest point, and that would be just uh, uh, an incredible, terrifying fall. Um, and, and so we're just all hoping and praying that 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 those people who are on the bridge can survive this. And of course, we also have in mind the, the people, the first responders, uh, and their safety as well. Um, from what you're able to see and what you've been able to hear, the, the bridge collapse is, is done. But is there any concern, I wonder, whether any more pieces can actually fall? You know, it looked like there was a little bit of a precarious piece there. I'm sure that is uh, something that first responders are taking under consideration. Also, just the massive parts of the structure, that steel structure that are in the water right now, that also poses a challenge. And we've been talking about some of the other challenges, just uh, it's cold. I mean, uh, hypothermia could set in. The water is roughly, I'd say, 47 degrees uh, right now. And if you're exposed to that, water for any length of time, uh, you are vulnerable to hypothermia in this. Uh, so uh, they want to get, if, they're, they're, if people survive this, if people are in the water, the priority is to get them out as fast as possible. And you're dealing with, uh, you know, water that has a lot of silt, low visibility. That's another challenge to these first responders. Most definitely, and of course, uh, I was just talking with Meg McNamara over in the Weather Center, and, uh, and she was telling us that the, the sun won't rise until 6.59, uh, so we have about an hour before we see sunrise and they're actually to, to, to be able to actually have a visibility. And Mike, so we have a better idea, where in Baltimore County are you exactly, what neighborhood are you in? So we're in part of Turner Station. Uh, we're off this kind of, it's called Maryland Avenue. Uh, it's just right past the port. So if we can show again, just you see um, the port is just right off to my side. And then, you know what? I know it's gonna be a lot. Let's swing this around a little bit. 
and we'll, we'll show you just how close we are to some of these houses. And these are some of the people who heard this. So there's a house right there next to the water. And then if we go over here, um, you can see there's just a, a, a few other houses uh, very, very close to the water. And again, we're right up uh, the closest houses to the port of Baltimore uh, in the Baltimore County side. And when we were over on the Anne Arundel County side earlier, um, you know, a lot of that is more industrial. So we've got more homes around here on the Baltimore County side. And then the bridge, uh, well, what, what was the bridge is just right out there in the middle of the water. And I know, again, it's dark. It can be difficult to see with the camera, but you, there are uh, flashing lights from the rescue crews uh, just on the other side of the Patapsco there. All right, thank you so much, Mike. We'll be checking in with you back uh, pretty shortly here. We do want to go to a statement that we've just gotten for Governor, from Governor Moore on the collapse of the bridge. He says, my office is in close communication with U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott, Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski, and the Baltimore Fire Department as emergency personnel are on the scene following the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. I have declared a state of emergency here in Maryland, and we are working with an interagency team to quickly deploy federal resources from the Biden administration. We are thankful for the brave men and women who are carrying out efforts to rescue those involved and pray for everyone's safety. We'll remain in close contact with federal, state, and local entities that are carrying out rescue efforts as we continue to assess and respond to this tragedy. Yes, Governor Westmore awakened, of uh, course, in the middle of the night, uh, as was uh, other uh, state and uh, local uh, uh, leaders being told about what had happened, the devastating news that uh, this container ship, uh, the Dolly, struck a pylon at the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing the entire bridge to collapse into the water. Uh, and, of course, that's when uh, these gentlemen have to really start uh, doing their jobs. Absolutely. Uh, they really have to start hustling and getting people together and get resources uh, coordinated. And this is one that obviously is going to require a great deal and a great deal of time in order to resolve. And, of course, we're uh, obviously praying for those people who are uh, in the water we right are. this very moment. And now let's check back in with Alexis Davila live on the Dundalk side of the bridge. Alexis, what's the latest there? Well, we are here because we were expecting that press conference to happen. We are now told that will be happening at 7 o'clock this morning. So we are going to stay put as we have been this whole morning. We were the first ones on scene here, and I want you to take a look because we are only less than a quarter of a mile away from where all of this happened. You can still see some of the flashing red lights as they are deterring the travelers from coming in this area. Helicopters are monitoring this area as well. We have spotted even a portion of this bridge, a bit of an outlook earlier this morning of a shadow of the ship that we were talking about. This this morning because a container ship had hit the bridge at 1.30 this morning in the Patapsco River area. Lights went out as the ship hit and the bridge came coming down, most of it falling right into the water area. Kevin Cartwright with Baltimore City Fire Department telling us that there are possibly up to 20 people in the water. We know there's rescue efforts underway as we speak. Now this ship that we have learned is registered to Singapore, was supposed to be going to Sri Lanka area as we were looking that up with the ship. ship tracker excuse me now this is a big main bridge area and I want to highlight that because this means a lot to the Baltimore area this helps interstate connector for interstate 695 this is definitely means now that 695 loop is completely gone this is something that's so pivotal for a lot of travelers I want you to understand that this is a 1.6 mile bridge or once was a 1.6 mile bridge four lanes wide and now we're talking about 31,000 vehicles that would normally take this day in and day out and it's completely gone. It's a bridge that has been around since 1977 and now it's wiped away, but understand that trucks that have come through here tend to take it because they would avoid the harbor tunnels and all those areas that they are not able to, especially if they're bringing hazardous material. So with that being said, we would just want to stay here on scene as we're waiting for that press conference to be happening at 7 o'clock this morning. We're being told that MDOT will be showing up here, Mayor Brandon Scott and a few other state leaders. Reporting live, I'm Alexis Davila for WJZ. Thank you, Alexis. Let's go now to Amy Kawada. She's in Hawkins Point. Amy has brought us some compelling uh, interviews with people who live in the area, who have an emotional attachment uh, to this bridge and to the region. Uh, Amy, uh, we see that the, you're at the location where it seems like a lot of vehicles are coming and going. It looks like an entry point for a lot of the emergency responders. Bring us up to date, please. 
Yeah, Vic, Sina, that's exactly right. Uh, right now, as we've been mentioning throughout the morning, the focus right now is recovery efforts. Uh, as we've heard, uh, Baltimore City Fire Chief PIO Kevin Cartwright says uh, recovery efforts are underway now for up to 20 people. Uh, we have been seeing a massive response here. Uh, we are still about a mile uh, away from the access to the Key Bridge right now. We're at Fort Armistead Road. This is the Baltimore City and Arundel County borderline. But just moments ago, we saw Baltimore County uh, underwater recovery efforts and a boat. Uh, rescue boats arrive. We've seen people from Howard County and Arundel County, uh, PG fire. Uh, this is a multiple multi statewide uh, a, a response effort to this uh, incident that occurred around. Thanks so much for staying with us. We are following some breaking news this hour on a bridge collapse in Baltimore. We'll take you live now to a CBS News special report. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Tony DeCoppel in New York, and we are coming on your air at this early hour with breaking news, a catastrophic bridge collapse in Baltimore, and the Maryland governor has just declared a state of emergency. Let's go to the pictures because they are dramatic indeed. This is the Francis Scott Key Bridge stitching together two major counties in Maryland, and that is a cargo ship colliding with a pillar. This is 1.30 a.m. local time. That cargo ship, the Dolly, hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge and sent the principal section, the main stretch of this bridge, into the water. Rescue boats are now on the scene, and we are hearing from the Baltimore Fire Department that up to 20 people may be in the water. They're calling it a, quote, developing mass, mass casualty event. The good news at this hour is the Coast Guard says they do not have confirmed casualties at this time. A search is underway. The Francis Scott Key Bridge as I mentioned, connection connects two major counties in the Baltimore area. It is more than a mile and a half long. It's been open for nearly 50 years, one of the longer bridges in this country and a major artery for shipping and for passengers, for vehicles. Tens of thousands a day cross this bridge. Let's take a live look at the rescue efforts. The sun has yet to come up there in Baltimore, but you can see the ship there the shadow of it anyway, and the stricken bridge collapsed around it. That is where the bridge once stood. Behind it, you have Baltimore Harbor, the cranes that load those giant cargo ships. All but this one have been going under that bridge without incident for many decades. We have team coverage of this story. We're going to begin with Nicole Skanga. She is near the scene in Baltimore Forest in Dundalk, Maryland. Nicole, good morning. What do you see? What do you know where you are? The Tony, good morning. Authorities calling this a mass casualty event, a multi-agency rescue and recovery currently underway. And as you mentioned, a state of emergency declared by Maryland Governor West Moore right here in this harrowing scene. The Baltimore fire chief saying as many as 20 people were plunged into the water here, into the harbor, when an outbound cargo ship, the Dolly, collided with a support beam of the Francis Scott Key Bridge and multiple vehicles, including a tractor trailer, also dropping into the water at this time, creating just a chaotic scene for first responders and law enforcement here on the ground. You mentioned the U.S. Coast Guard deploying their maritime teams, but we also know that dive teams have been deployed, that state and local police are on the ground. We've been seeing the cars pass by. You can see some police over my right shoulder here stopping traffic. We also know FBI and ATF are on the scene and they are working to rescue any and all survivors now cloaked by darkness and in frigid temperatures of mid 40s. Of course, hypothermia, a concern here as well. We expect a briefing to occur around 7 a.m. local, 7 a.m. Eastern time. We know that the governor and the Baltimore mayor are both en route, uh, that the transportation secretary has been briefed here on the situation on the ground. The priority, of course, saving lives pulling people out of the waters here. But we should note this is a major thoroughfare uh, that has now been uh, put in a, in a frozen state here, Tony. Yeah, and on the rescue efforts, Nicole, the Patapsico River there, you're dealing with currents, you're dealing with tides into the Chesapeake Bay. And as you mentioned, those frigid temperatures, the survival time for temperatures of that degree are one to three hours. So time is of the essence here as rescue 
uh, and officials make their uh, their work uh, as best they can. Uh, Nicole Skanga in Dundalk, Maryland. We're going to leave you there, Nicole, and go over to Chris Van Cleve, our senior transportation correspondent. Chris, the ship itself, 1.30 a.m., it's leaving the port of Baltimore. What can you tell us about it? Where is it going? What is it doing? Well, the dolly was heading to Sri Lanka. This is a enormous vessel. We're talking about 155,000 tons, 900 feet long, nearly 150 feet wide. It was loaded down with cargo containers when it struck that bridge support, 155,000 tons of mass being driven into that bridge support. And you saw it brought the bridge down uh, very quickly brought the bridge down on top of that ship, which means you also have the potential that cargo containers are in the water. The bridge is in the water. Uh, you, you had a work crew, we understand, on the bridge with as many as 13 people working on the bridge in addition to any vehicles that were there. Uh, this is a, a very, very difficult, almost worst case scenario for a, a situation like this. You're dealing with 48 degree water, give or take, according to the National Weather Service. Uh, it's dark. There's a lot of debris. It's going to be a challenging rescue effort for sure. Uh, and then there's also a question about uh, what does that mean for the nation's ninth busiest port, which uh, its main thoroughfare, main point of access to the water is now blocked by debris and this ship. Yeah, so Chris, there's a question of boats being able to come in and out. That'll have an economic impact. I'm sure we'll be following that in the days ahead. But for this morning, for the, the vehicles, for the people in the Maryland area, what was the significance of that bridge for their lives, for their daily commutes? Well, you know, I think there are two significant things here. This bridge was really a landmark in Baltimore. It is something that anyone who has spent time in Baltimore has seen. It's, uh, it is an enormous bridge. It's been there nearly 50 years. Uh, it handled about 31,000 vehicles a day. It is one of the three crossings of Baltimore Harbor. The other two are tunnels. It was the outermost. It was part of the Baltimore Beltway 695. So for commuters, it's going to mean uh, finding alternative ways to get where they need to go. Uh, those tunnels can only handle so much traffic at a time. Uh, you know, they're, 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 you, know you, you can't, uh, there's not a shoulder, you can't expand those tunnels. So uh, it, yeah. it, it's going to mean for a considerable amount of time uh, major disruptions for drivers in the Baltimore area, Tony. Yeah. Chris Van Cleve, Chris, thank you very much. We're going to go now to Robert Sumwalt, the former NTSB chair. Robert, good morning to you. You're watching this unfold as we are. From an investigatory standpoint, what are the next steps? Well, Tony, good morning. Yes, the uh, NTSB will be involved in this. They will probably uh, be the lead federal agency uh, in this case. They'll share uh, some of it with the Coast Guard. Uh, investigators will have a lot to go on here. They will have, uh, it looks to me like the bridge collapsed onto the bow of uh, the, the, the bridge collapsed onto the bow of the ship. So you're going to have a surviving crew from the uh, from the ship. There'll be voyage data recorders that they can recover. Uh, so I think the NTSB and the Coast Guard will have a lot to go on here to try and understand why this ship was steered into a piling of this, of this bridge. Yeah, that is gonna be the big question. Uh, what do we know at this hour about the traffic that may have been on top of the bridge and what is the NTSB role in? You know, one question I think that's gonna be coming up immediately in people's minds is should this bridge sh uh, have been capable of withstanding, given its location, a strike like this? Well, there are fenders that are around a bridge support like this, but when you have a, a, a very large container ship like this one, uh, there's really not going to be much that can, that can protect a bridge against that type of a strike. All right, Robert Sumwalt, former NTSB uh, chair, giving us an outline of the investigation that will follow. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate all of our correspondents and analysts here. If you're just joining us, the Francis Scott Key Bridge connecting two major sections of Maryland has collapsed this morning after a ship strike. A lot of history in that area. This is now part of it. We will have a, a, a press conference later this morning. It should happen very soon. We will bring you live coverage of that when it happens, and we'll have much more, of course, on CBS Mornings at 7 a.m. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Tony DeCopel in New York. And if you're just joining us now, you've been watching a CBS News special report on this major bridge collapse in Maryland. It happened at around 1.30 a.m. Eastern earlier this morning. A cargo ship, we're learning, crashed into the bridge, 
causing it to collapse, sending cars and people flying into the water. Our coverage will continue with CBS News Baltimore. As Tony just mentioned, we are expecting to hear from Baltimore's uh, city fire chief at around 6.15 this morning. So in just a few moments, we'll take you there live as soon as that begins. In the area uh, who live with this bridge as part of their lives. They've been uh, watching this uh, bridge and using this bridge for so many, many, many years. And of course, right now, another major concern we have right now is for the traffic situation. Uh, we need to figure out ways to be able to navigate around uh, the, uh, the, the, the devastation right now. We're going to go now to Angela Foster in our first order traffic center uh, to, to give us more information. Thank you, Vic. And of course, for those of you who are just waking up, what we are advising, no matter if you take the key bridge or not, if you travel around the greater Baltimore region, please plan to get out as early as you possibly can. Now, with the bridge collapsing, that means, of course, all lanes are closed. There are no lanes and we have detours in place. MDTA officials have posted detours from the Dundalk side as well as from the Hawkins Point side of the key bridge to give you alternate routes in place. Now, now, if you're in that neighborhood, of course, or for those who are not in the neighborhood, we're telling you to take the uh, the tunnels. This is a live look at the Fort McHenry Tunnel. Now, the Fort McHenry Tunnel is probably going to get the bulk of those who can get through because that is the bigger of the two tunnels. It is actually about 14 feet high, 8 feet wide. But now, if you travel, plan to travel 895, please be prepared that there will be stopped traffic because certain tractor trailers will be prohibited from getting through the harbor tunnel as it is not as wide and not as high as the Fort McHenry tunnel. So you are likely to run into not just congestion, but stopped traffic with officials stopping vehicles, especially those tractor trailers that are choosing to take the tunnels. Those who can, some cannot. Now for the tractor trailers that cannot due to whatever they are uh, transporting, you'll have to, of course, go to the east side or west side of I-695, where we are also expecting a lot of delays. Now these are just some of the the streets on the local side, the Dundalk side, where Alexis Davila is reporting live for us, North Point Boulevard, Peninsula Expressway, and Dundalk Avenue. We're expecting those secondary roads to be over flooded with traffic, so plan accordingly as you head out this morning. And if you happen to be on the Fort Armistead side of the bridge this morning, be prepared for some additional traffic. It is truly going to be stop and go on Fort Smallwood Road especially, but also on Hawkins Point Road and Pennington Avenue, there will be a lot of bailout traffic. Again, the big decision this morning for you is to get out early. That's a look at first alert traffic. Thank you, Angela. And yes, of course, we do want to get you out the door. If you are planning to leave early, we know as we've been hearing from Mike Helgren all morning, this is an all hands on deck rescue operation. We do have our eye on the conditions there, and we actually have a weather station at the Francis Scott Key Bridge for the Patapsico River. So the air temperature in that area, 43 degrees. The water temperature is about 47 degrees. So of course that would be the main issue working against rescue crews this morning is how cold the waters are. The winds, Northeast right around 10 to 15 knots. The waves are one foot. That next high tide is going to be at 820. We do have mostly cloudy skies. That's what we're all waking up to this morning. But as far as fog, it doesn't look like that should be an issue for the visibility. But another thing working against crews is that, of course, it is still dark. We don't have our sunrise this morning until 659. <clears throat> so in the meantime, we'll get a little bit of daylight starting to creep in. <laughs> but we won't have full daylight uh, for another hour or so. So that is definitely working against the rescue crews. Temperatures around the Baltimore area here, if you are headed out, <coughs> you're waking up to the low to mid 30s. Some spots are in the 40s, and we've had this very persistent northeast wind. You'll notice we're not dealing as with a particularly blustery day. And as we move through our Tuesday, the clouds are going to be with us. So you could get a break of sun or two to start your day. But then the clouds are pretty much going to be in full force, and that's going to keep temperatures from climbing above the low 50s. We are quiet on the radar here. Uh, we don't have any rain to contend with until this evening. And then what we'll see happen is some of this wet weather is going to edge into far western Maryland, but it really kind of breaks apart before it gets to us in the Baltimore area. 
We have more rain though to get through Wednesday into Thursday. So we're going to have this coastal storm setting up could bring us some wet weather. Notice the scattered rain here moving into the Baltimore area tomorrow morning. So we have to plan for a wet commute to work for your Wednesday and then that rain continuing to spread across the area through the day. Here we are four o'clock. So some of you are then headed home from work. We're dealing with another batch of rain. Notice the bulk of the rain, including the heaviest of it, is going to stay over southern Maryland, the lower half of the eastern shore. It's starting to hug the shore more, so that means we could miss out on the bulk of it for our Thursday. So here we are 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a very important time, of course, for our O's home opener. And at that point, we're seeing a lot of clouds, but there is a chance that the rain is going to steer clear of us for the most part on Thursday. This is just one model. But this is something that we're really watching. We talked about how if this system starts to edge closer to the shore, the bulk of the rain would miss us. I'm sure you heard that from Chief Meteorologist Derek Beasley last night. He's keeping a very close eye on your O's home opener forecast for you. So this is something that we are certainly watching and we will keep you posted on. Now for today, we're looking at this high 53 degrees. So normal high for this time of year, 58. We're going to be about five degrees shy of that with the clouds in full force. As I mentioned, our sunrise at 659. And then tonight, cloudy skies sticking around and temperatures are only going to drop into the 40s. So when we have these cloudy skies overnight, that means we don't tumble too far down into the 30s and 20s. Rather, we're just going to bottom out in the low 40s. Uh, taking a look here at our seven day forecast. So of course we have that O's home opener on Thursday. Periods of rain possible. Looks like we could miss out on the bulk of the rain here for our Thursday. And then by Friday, we wish we had Friday's forecast for the O's, O's home opener, but instead we get the sunshine in low 60s on Friday rather than Thursday. Looking ahead to your Easter weekend here. So mid 60s for Saturday with the mix of sun and clouds. The second half of your weekend, your Easter, they're low 60s, and we're going to see a mix of sun and clouds. Both days over the weekend should be dry. Small chance for a couple of showers for your Easter Sunday, but for the most part, we are going to be dry. Of course, by tomorrow, that's when we start to see that wet weather really kind of taking hold. So today is the last dry day, but it's the transition day, whereas yesterday we had a lot of sunshine. Today we have a whole lot of clouds. Vic, Sina? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, of course, are continuing to follow the major developments this morning uh, surrounding the fact that a container ship named the Dali, D-A-L-I, um, smashed into a pylon of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing the entire bridge to collapse into the Patapsco River. That happened around 1.30 this morning. We know at this point there are up to 20 people in the water, reports of several cars in the water as well. So you have almost every county from across the state and their fire rescue team trying to help support the search and rescue effort that's happening uh, in that water, which, as, we, as we've mentioned, very cold right now. 47 degrees is the water temperature. Yes, and we also get a little bit of a new information here from the Associated Press. They're indicating that the ship caught fire and thick black smoke billowed out of the, the actual uh, ship at the time uh, that this actually occurred. Uh, we have also heard reports that there was a power outage, possibly multiple power failures on board the ship, uh, and the, given the the size of it uh, and uh, the the speed with which it was going, it's impossible for it to stop uh, crashing into the pylons. As we mentioned, a number of agencies are involved right now, mm -hmm. including the FBI, not to indicate that there is any type of criminal intent, but I think uh, out of a, an abundance of caution, they brought in a number of different agencies in order to investigate this entire situation. And we've seen the response from our local leaders, our, our uh, Baltimore County Executive, the mayor, as well as our governor, and even national uh, our Federal, excuse me, representatives as well. We've heard from the state, uh, state uh, secretary of transportation, excuse me, Pete Buttigieg. So an all-encompassing response to this incident right now. State of emergency right now declared by uh, Governor Moore, uh, which means that uh, every possible agency that could be uh, needed uh, is going to be available, as well as uh, it allows them to have more uh, interaction with federal government and federal resources in order to be able to take care of the situation. Port of Baltimore, obviously devastated by this entire situation right. Right now, this is an important part of our uh, economy, uh, representing $3.3 billion in personal income, over 15,000 direct jobs, over 139,000 connected jobs, and $26 billion in international freight uh, that comes through this area, that which represents about 
three percent of the uh, value of waterborne um, traffic and uh, freight that comes uh, uh, to Baltimore and, and around the world. And not to mention the unimaginable and immeasurable emotional impact. We've, we've heard from so many people who have talked about what a fixture this bridge has been throughout their whole lives. And to see it now gone, the emotional weight of that, it's, it's just immeasurable. At this very moment, we're awaiting a news conference that was scheduled for 6.15 this morning um, with uh, local and uh, p possibly state officials. We know that uh, Baltimore County Executive uh, uh, is going to be involved as well as the mayor of Baltimore and uh, the fire and rescue personnel as well. And we've been talking about how search and rescue is really the priority here, but we have a long ways to go even after that as far as the recovery and the rebuild of such a major piece of infrastructure for the whole region. As we've mentioned, it's it, this is a major connector. Oh, no question at all. And we saw the, that live picture right there. That's where the, the news conference is going to take place. Hopefully at any moment now, I think everyone is really anxious now to get updated information, particularly concerning is the fact that we have been saying that they have been searching for 20 people. Uh, a lot of people want to know, was anybody rescued? Uh, how many more people are there out there looking for at this very moment? Uh, what's also uh, uh, amazing about this entire situation is how fast this bridge collapsed. As you saw just there, uh, once that ship hit that major pylon, right. it just collapsed like a, a toy or something out of a movie. Uh, yeah, exactly. A toy. You're, you're almost not uh, realizing 1.6 six miles, like you said, went down so quickly. It, it's hard to imagine. We mentioned that ship, a thousand feet long, about 150 wide, so it is quite substantial. But when you think about that up against this sizable bridge, yeah, it's, it's almost not computing. Yes, we, we've talked to a number of people uh, this morning, throughout the morning in our coverage. I think we have some sound now from someone who was a witness or who has been affected by this entire situation. I, I drive a lot, right? Okay. I was in my driveway, and my granddaughter showed me the picture of the bridge collapsing. I went down the other place to see, and I couldn't see, and I was going to come here and see. But it's surprising. It's just yeah. the bridge she just collapsed. Oh, I was there not even not, yesterday. I took the people home on the other side of Key Bridge. They live in Dundalk. And to see the bridge gone, knowing that I was on the bridge about even 10, 10 hours ago, it's devastating and because I could have been there. And, of course, that gentleman uh, also uh, indicated that he it was – just emotionally distraught uh, over the possibility that people could have lost their lives there. He indicated that he was going to be going to church to light a candle and to yes. say prayers. Yes. And I'm certain there are a number of other people who will be doing the very same thing. This, of course, happening, you know, this is Holy Week. Uh, oh, we're yes. coming up on Easter oh, on, yes. on, on Sunday. And so for those who have, uh, are people of faith, I'm sure that this is something that uh, will be a part of their prayers. And his last sentence is such a prevailing sentiment right now. I could have been there. So many people waking up thinking, that could have been me. And, and we've mentioned, as devastating as this is, when you think about the time of day, it really could have been much worse had it been later in Absolutely. the day, later in the afternoon. Absolutely. Yes. More vehicles could have been on there. Mm -hmm. We understand there may have been a crew actually working on the bridge at the time that this happened. Uh, so uh, the, the devastation is just widespread from so many different angles, from a personal uh, angle for people who live near the, near the bridge. Mm -hmm. And we are waiting to hear from officials, as we said, so make sure you're staying with us. We do want to hear the latest from them. But, yeah, in the meantime, it, it's, it's, it's a lot to reflect on. It's a lot to, it's a lot to take in this right. morning. Let's go back to our picture of the area where the news conference is going to be taking place uh, this morning. Uh, we know that our cameras are set up there and awaiting the arrival of city officials, of state officials, and federal officials, if possible. And... Uh, we uh, actually have some other sound from uh, earlier this morning, uh, people who uh, uh, experienced this situation. The ship had crashed into the Key Bridge, and I, I couldn't believe my ears. Well, they sent the video with it, and I saw it from my own eyes, and it's unbelievable, unbelievable. This is going to be catastrophic for many reasons. Number one, the harbor's blocked. Number two, we're not going to get any more new car deliveries at this time. We're, Amazon is just on the other side of the, the river, and you can forget your same day, next day delivery packages. The beltway is going to be a parking lot. The tunnels are going to be over jammed. And that's not even talking about the death of the, the people that were working on the bridge, uh, maybe driving across the bridge. We don't know. It's, it's like 4 in the morning. Uh, I heard it happened at 1.30. We had the windows open in my bedroom. Didn't hear anything. 
didn't hear, I don't know what happened, but the story that I heard, and I believe me, this is not, I don't know if this is true, is that somehow the ship lost power and just crashed into the pilings, and that's all it took. Because, you know, a bridge is a very fragile structure. It can actually, it's like a house of cards. You hit it in the perfect spot, and it's gone which obviously played out in that situation this yeah. morning, just how quickly the bridge fell into the Patapsco River. And we don't think of bridges as being that fragile. And as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's calling to mind a greater level of just caution. We have so many bridges. We're a coastal, a coastal region, and so I'm sure a lot of people are thinking twice as they get behind the wheel this morning. Most definitely. And we uh, obviously have been hearing from people from the local, national uh, level. Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, uh, tweeted out some information this morning. I think we have that for, uh, for you to see. Uh, the Secretary obviously uh, uh, reiterating what the, the, the mayor and the governor have been saying, that this is a terrible situation. He said he has spoken with Mayor Governor Moore and Mayor Scott to offer the U.S. DOT support following the vessel strike and collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Rescue efforts remain underway, and drivers in the Baltimore area should follow local responder guidance on detours and response. Yeah, eyes on this at every level, local, state, federal, this morning. All right, Angela Foster with our traffic team uh, uh, brought us an update uh, on, on the, the road closures from uh, from this morning. 695, that's section 695. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to find another way. They're suggesting that people use the tunnels. Uh, and so just we're going to need a great deal of patience this morning for people who are uh, going to be out and about driving. Uh, this again, another live picture right this very moment of the ship, and it's getting a, just a little bit lighter. We're able to see a few more details than we were able to see uh, uh, this morning at uh, four o'clock when we first started. Mm -hmm. And there you see the remnants of the bridge. There's still uh, sort of hanging on on top of on top of the dolly here. Just just incredible to see this image here. Yes, and we understand that, that no one on board the ship was injured. Uh, we do know that it uh, suffered... Uh This is a CBS News special report. I'm Tony DeCopel in New York, back on your screen, coming on the air again with more on that catastrophic bridge collapse in Baltimore because officials are about to hold a news conference as the sun comes up there in Baltimore. We get a better picture of what remains of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. That is the cargo ship, the Dolly, striking a pillar and the bridge collapsing about 1.30 a.m. local time. We are advised that that principal section of the bridge is now in the water, and the fire department says somewhere between seven and up to 20 people may be in the water now. Rescue efforts are underway. We are hoping to learn more from this news conference. It's underway now. Let's listen in. Uh, we began to receive indications that a, uh, a ship may have struck the key bridge. We got further information through multiple calls that the key bridge, um, portions of the key bridge had actually collapsed. At about 0150 hours, our first unit arrived on scene and reported um, a complete collapse of the key bridge. Um, we were also given information at that time that there were likely multiple people on the bridge at the time of the collapse and that as a result, multiple people were in the water. We were able to remove uh, two people from the water. One individual refused service and refused transport. Essentially, that person was not injured. However, there was another individual that's been transported to a local trauma center that is in very serious condition. At this time, we have multiple air assets from the Maryland State Police, as well as the Baltimore Police Department, as well as multiple Marine assets from around the region, including Baltimore City, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, as well as multiple local and state police uh, agencies, uh, National Resources Police, um, BPD Special Ops Unit is in here, Maryland State Police is here. We have multiple resources. We are still very much in an active search and rescue posture at this point, and we will continue to be for some time. We have a large area that we have to search. This includes on the surface of the water, subsurface, as well as on the deck of the ship itself. We believe at this point, we may be looking for, we 
You may be looking for upwards of seven individuals. That's the latest information we have. However, what I will say is, is the information that I'm giving you right now is as of right now. That's what we know right now. Um, this is a very large incident. It involves a very large footprint. Multiple agencies are operating. Therefore, information is subject to change as we get more intel um, and as our crews work through the morning. Um, over the next 8 to 12 hours, you can expect to continue to see um, our air and maritime assets functioning um, out on the water and in the air above. Um, we need to do damage assessment of, of the ship itself before we can board that ship. Um, and we need to continue our subsurface search, which is including um, different types of sonar. We have side scan sonar. We have other sonar capabilities here. We have underwater um, UAVs that we're working with. And throughout the night, we've also been working with uh, infrared technology, both from the air and on the water surface. So um, I'm going to wrap up here with just saying this continues to be a search and rescue operation. It continues to be a very dynamic operation with multiple local, state, and federal resources involved. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our mayor, Mayor Brandon Scott. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, everyone, this is a unthinkable a tragedy. Uh, we have to uh, first and foremost pray for all of those who are impacted, uh, those families. Uh, pray for our first responders and thank them, uh, all of them working together, uh, city, state, local, to make sure that we are uh, working through this uh, tragedy. Uh, this is an ongoing, active uh, research uh, that we're having right now. We're going to continue, as you heard from Chief Wallace, to throughout as long as we have to be doing that, we will do it. Uh, but we have to be thinking about the families and people impacted, uh, folks who uh, we have to try to find and save. This is what our focus should be on right now. Uh, we're going to continue to work in partnership with every part of government to do everything that we can uh, to get us through the other side of this tragedy. And with that, I'll turn it over to County Executive Olszewski. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Um, I think we all awoke this morning to an unspeakable tragedy. Uh, as the mayor indicated, we know that there will be families and individuals impacted by this, regardless of what happens the rest of the way out. Uh, so I would just echo the mayor in lifting up prayers for those who are impacted, but also ask that our residents pay, pray for our first responders. Um, you know, they have been on scene since very early in the morning. Um, not only conducting initial search and rescue operations, but planning for the additional ones as the sun comes up. And, um, you know, the work that they do cannot be understated. And we just, I want to just thank them for all that they are doing and, and will do in the hours and days ahead. Uh, we know that we have a long road ahead, not just in the search and rescue, but in the fallout following this. Uh, I think we appropriately have our attention on the search and rescue efforts currently uh, and just here alongside uh, our partners in the city to say that they have our full support, just as we want to thank um, our state partners for the resources they've offered up, uh, as well as uh, the federal partners who have already reached out. Uh, the mayor and I have talked to the governor. We've, we've heard from the secretary of transportation. Uh, so collectively, we thank everyone for uh, their thoughts, their well wishes. Uh, but again, this is a very active situation, and we want to just thank uh, the chief and our teams for all the great work they're doing. And with that, I'll turn things back over to the chief. Thank you, County Detective Olszewski. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A right now. Now we're just going to go around and have everyone uh, present one question. Chief, can you tell us where the crew of the ship is? Um, you also mentioned, too, that uh, two people were rescued. Who made the first 911 call? And there were reports that it was a crew on the deck of the ship working at that point. Can you confirm any of that? The latest information we have on the, sh on the crew of the ship is that they are still on board the ship. Um, there's been comms between the ship crew and the Coast Guard. So as, as part of the uh, overall operation, we communicate through the Coast Guard with the ship. And, and I'm sorry, your other questions? There were two people taken. Who made the first 911 call? I don't know who's who made that call yet. Okay, and there were, were there other workers on the, the deck of the ship of this, or the deck of the bridge at this point? We had heard that information. Can you confirm that? We were being told there were workers on the bridge. We have yet to confirm that. Um, we'll work with MDTA to, to 
you know, obviously to get that information. About how many cars were on that ship? Last question. Uh, on the uh, on the deck of the bridge at the time it collapsed. You don't, know. don't have a number. I can tell you our sonar has detected the presence of vehicles submerged in the water. I don't have a count of that yet. Thank you. Uh, Chief, you mentioned upwards of seven individuals that you're looking for. We've heard reports of as many as 20 individuals. Can you just paint a more clear picture of about how many people actually fell into the water, how many people you might be uh, looking to rescue, and also if you can give an idea of how many vehicles, although you might not have an answer, but really just like search <clears throat> Yeah, I'll start with the last one. So I don't know how many vehicles yet. I know that we have detected the presence of vehicles. As far as the number between the seven and 20, that's been a dynamic count um, throughout the morning, just given the fact that we haven't yet nailed that number down. We do believe that at least seven are involved in that, at least seven at this point. That fell into the water. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I know you said the crew was accounted for according to the Coast Guard on deck. Do we know if any of the crew members were part of these at least seven people that may have been in the water? We do not. So we'll be guided by, by our dive teams. We will determine what the temperature of the water is. The other issue that we have out there is this water is, is, is current uh, influenced. So right now we think the tide is coming back in. That adds a bit of a challenge to us also. We can certainly dive in these conditions, but we have to take a lot of factors into play, right? The fact that there may be trauma involved, they have been in, a, in the water an extended period of time. Um, but also remember, we're battling darkness. So, you know, it's, it's quite possible that we may have somebody there that we've not seen yet. Um, and as they work closer to the debris field, um, you know, they'll, they'll obviously make those determinations. But we're going to rely on the experts, which are our, our, our dive masters that are here, our dive team, to tell us when they believe we've reached that, that, that non-survivability point. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jimmy? Chief Wallace, was there any indication that there was a problem on the ship? Was it led in by tugboats at any point during the main day? Like anything that can uh, so far early on point you that something went wrong? We, we do not have that information with regard to the investigation. I would refer that to, to law enforcement. My, my focus since 1.40 this morning has been that rescue operation. So, so far there's been no indication that any kind of like an emergency dispatch came from that ship beforehand? I have no information about that, ma'am. Have, have you been able to talk to the pilot, the American pilot on, on that bridge? The, the, the pilot on the vessel? Yeah. We have not talked to the pilot on the vessel. The rescue personnel, the rescue operation, we have not interacted. Chief, back what over you, here. What can you tell us about the victims that were moved from water? Man, woman. I don't have age and. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't have age and gender on either. One patient refused service. Right. It, really, they weren't injured. The second patient, however, was seriously injured and is at an area trauma center. Are you including them in the seven, at least seven people? We don't know yet if they're part of that seven. Okay. The, the, the the patient is injured severely enough that we've not been able to debrief that patient. That seven number, did that come from people witnessing cars going down? Like, where did that number come from? Or is that just from the sonar hits that you've got? No, that was the initial information that we got as we were arriving on the scene, that number. And that number, again, as I said earlier, has fluctuated, right? But that, that seven has been a consistent number. How many agencies are here assisting right now with this oh, wow. recovery? Dozens. Um, yeah, dozens. I mean... Locally, you know, fire department wise, Baltimore County's here, Howard County's here, Hartford uh, was here, PG was here, um, Anne Arundel, um, of course, Baltimore City. And a lot of those agencies are here by virtue of the fact that they may have specialized equipment that we need during. You've been listening to a news conference with James Wallace, Fire Chief, Baltimore City Fire Department, who told us they have pulled two people from the water so far, one in good condition, the second now at a trauma center nearby, hurt badly enough they have not debriefed him. They've also been able to locate vehicles in the water using sonar, the chief said. We are joined now by former NTSB Chair Robert Sumwalt. Uh, Robert, thank you again for being with us. You were listening along with me. What stood out to you? 
Well, Tony, at this point, uh, as they as they indicated, they're really in a search and rescue phase, and that will have to come first uh, before any sort of uh, NTSB or Coast Guard investigators get involved in this. You know, Robert, they describe the situation as dynamic. They're dealing with tides. It's a search and rescue operation. There's a surface area they're looking at, a subsurface area they're looking at, and also the deck of the ship itself is an area where they might find people. Uh, when you think about the scope and the scale of this event, where does it fit in your experience? Well, I dealt with over 200 accidents when I was at the uh, NTSB, including being the chairman. And this is certainly, a, a, first of all, it's a rare event. It's a very sad event. And as said, my thoughts and prayers go out for all of those who've been affected. Um, you know, I, I agree with the police chief there is that the number of, uh, of casualties is going to be a dynamic number. It's going to change. And unfortunately, I'm afraid it's going to increase. Mm. We heard a, a question from somebody there uh, at the press conference about the pilot, the you know the driver of this ship that struck a piling. They haven't uh, been able to debrief that pilot, but it sounded like, and we haven't confirmed this, it might be an American who was at the controls there. Um, what? How does that fit into your approach to investigating this? We might have local people behind the driving of the ship as opposed to an international situation. Well, you're exactly right. Uh, uh, in the United States and across the globe, they use local pilots to direct the navigation of the ship in and out of ports. So there will be a U.S. pilot on board who is giving commands to the helm. And so um, huh. it, from international law perspective, I, I can't tell you anything about that. But what I can tell you is that, yes, there was a there is a U.S. pilot who is on board that ship. Wow, that, that, that deepens the mystery here, Robert. I have to say, at the, at, at the hour of the morning, they just left port. You can't say that the person who was on that ship did not know the waterways if it's a local person. So we're gonna be looking at, adds to the questions we will have. Was it a mechanical problem? Was it human error? Was it something else? Uh, Robert Sumwalt, thank you very much for telling us what you know at this early hour. We're gonna have much more on this breaking news on CBS Mornings coming up in just about 19 minutes at 7 a.m. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Tony DeCopel in New York. And you've been watching a CBS News special report on this major bridge collapse in Maryland. So we know this happened around 1.30 a.m. Eastern earlier this morning. That's when a cargo ship crashed into the bridge, causing that massive collapse. We also now heard from Baltimore's fire chief, James Wallace, saying two people so far have been rescued. One uninjured. The other one was sent, now we know, to a trauma center in serious condition. We can also report a state of emergency has been declared. This essentially means that multiple agencies are working in tandem on this very important search and rescue operation. Our coverage continues this hour with CBS News Baltimore. That's that's not my focus here, ma'am. That's part of the law enforcement investigation. So I would I would defer to to the proper authorities for that. And I'm to be honest, we saw something similar to this yeah. happen in Philly when 995 came. A portion of that came down. <coughs> I know you said that you guys have spoken to Secretary of Transportation. I'm assuming Judge. Has he made any comment about the assistance like we saw in Philly right, being so rushed through to get this? Uh, no, thank, no, thank you. I, I spoke with Secretary Bougies directly. Uh, he and his team said that they're going to obviously work with us throughout this incident and work with not just uh, the city and county, but really the state of Maryland uh, to make sure uh, that we have every resource that, that he and the federal government can provide. How long is it going to take to rebuild this, Mayor? I think right now, sir, uh, listen, we shouldn't even be having that discussion right now. The discussion right now should be about the people, the souls, the lives that we're trying to save. Uh, there will be a time to discuss about a bridge and how we get a bridge back up. But right now, there are people in the water that we have to get out. And that's the only thing we should be talking about. Well, I think to go back to the question about the, the terrorism, there is absolutely no indication that there's any terrorism, that, that this was done on purpose. 
our criminal intel is working with the FBI and other federal and state agencies to get all the intel that we have, but there's absolutely no indication that it was intentional. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I want to thank you all. Um, I will be advising you, updating you on the next briefing. Will that be here? Okay, we've been listening to a news conference that began a short while ago involving uh, the number of uh, federal, I mean, local uh, officials uh, describing what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the fire chief, James Wallace, this morning saying that 140, they received uh, their first call uh, about some type of incident on the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first responders got there within 10 minutes and indicated that the, the bridge had actually collapsed. Uh, and I guess they were all just kind of devastated by what they saw uh, using a lot of technology right now. They have sonar that indicate there are cars in the water. They indicate that two people have been pulled from the water. One of them is okay. Yes. Refused uh, some type of medical treatment. And then one, though, has been taken to the hospital in serious condition, and they're continuing to search for more. They mentioned that they're looking for at least seven people. All morning, we started reporting seven people. Then we heard it might be 20. They themselves have mentioned that that number has fluctuated, so they don't have an exact count of the number of people that they're searching for, but we're hearing it is at least, according to James Wallace, at least seven people. They did mention that they are still, uh, it's a large area to search. Absolutely. On board, all around that vessel. They have not managed to get on board the vessel just yet. We understand that there are still crew members on the vessel. Uh, they're not able to tell us, though, right now if members of crew members from that vessel are part of that count in the water. And as we're talking here and showing you these pictures, these are the first uh, real picture since daylight mm -hmm. uh, that actually show this. This is absolutely stunning uh, seeing this portion of the bridge on the deck uh, of the ship. We understand that the Coast Guard is in communication with uh, the crew members on board and uh, the uh, chief of uh, the fire department indicating that they needed to assess the entire situation before they can even board the ship yes. to go on board and check on the people who are there. They have no indication right yet that there are any injuries on board the ship. However, that's something they have to go on board and to assess uh, as the morning goes on. The other thing is that we're talking about the rescue. Uh, they have people in the water trying to rescue people, trying to find people. Uh, they, of course, know that, as we said, there are vehicles in the water, but they have no idea how many people may be in the water. And as you saw from that picture, uh, the water is moving pretty quickly right yeah, now. Yeah, a pretty so vigorous that current. Creates a, creates a very difficult situation for the divers. Indeed, and here's another live look of what we're uh, dealing with with out on the Patapsco River, another vantage point of the of the Dolly and that collapsed bridge. Right now, we want to go to Mike Helgren, who's been live in Baltimore County in the Turner Station area. Uh, Mike, what's the latest there? Uh, good morning. And now that the sun is up, we just want to show you what we are seeing in the Patapsco here and my angle here. And I want to start, if you can go into that, the ship there. And you can see just that massive ship in the middle of the water. And you can see the remnants of the bridge. And again, this is from the Baltimore County viewpoint. And the first thing I noticed when the sun started to go up is, is just over to the side of that, you can see the ramp uh, where that was leading to the bridge. And you can see there just there's no more bridge there. It's just heartbreaking. You can see just where, where it, it ends. You can see what's left of the key bridge. Uh, an absolutely incredible view. We've talked about the challenges, diesel fuel in the water, silt, the tide, the cold temperatures. At least we've got daylight now. Um, I want to bring in a neighbor here in this community, Jeremy, and you live uh, fairly close by. Uh, tell me, what did you see and hear again this around 1.30 this morning? Were you sleeping? Did, were, did it wake you up? I was sleeping and then it, like, it kind of sounded like uh, we have a lot of airplanes that go across. Mm -hmm. So it sounded like that at first and then we felt the vibration and then it was just like a really like vigorous like vibration. And Are you connected? Yes. Okay. Now, I mean, you could tell the bridge was gone this morning, but now it's just, it's a, it's tragic, man. Yeah. How many times would you say you've crossed the key bridge in your life? I mean, I just crossed it yesterday twice for work. It makes you think a lot, right? I mean, you never know what could happen. I mean, yeah, but you know, uh, life goes on, but I, I just pray for the people that are 
involved, you know. Yeah, and, and just describe, you know, the, even the conditions. It's it's cold out here. I mean, can you even imagine what, what they're having to go through? And, and they said they're going to keep, you know, searching. They're going to stay on this until they have gotten everyone out that they can. But it's got to be extraordinarily difficult. I can't imagine what, what they go through. I mean, I have first responders in my family, but uh, I tell you what, they'll get the job done. That's all I know. And, so. and and tell me, when you were like jolted, what did you think it was? Did you did you look at your phone right away? I mean, how long did it take oh, you to realize? Uh, I didn't look at my phone, but I, I did run outside because I thought like a plane crashed. Sounded and, that? It was that it was harsh? It was loud, yeah. So I was like, man, that's close. So I went and looked around, didn't see anything, and then went back inside, and my uncle actually called me and said, the key burst collapsed. So... I mean, it's such a t talk to me about the importance of that, you know, bridge too. I mean, it's I, I think I, I read a statistic roughly 30,000 cars a day. It's also where a lot of the uh, hazardous chemicals go through because they can't go through can't the tunnel. Through the tunnel, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the main vein right even now. even with uh, like plumbing, I'm in plumbing and HVAC right now. So even with plumbing, you can't take acetylene tanks through the tunnel. So it's going to be a big strain on not only just day to day, but tradesmen's lives as well. You know. Uh, I heard you say you used to fish under there. I mean, just to think of that massive steel structure, how big it is, and, and something that could cause it to collapse. I mean, it's baffling. I mean, I, I'm, I can't fish under there no more, but, uh, man, it's... I don't know the force the it, the force that it took to do that. It doesn't look like the the ship's damaged at all. So Massive I, ship, yeah. It, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's hard to even describe because I know people are seeing aerial views and and different angles of this. But just from right here where we are on the edge of the water, and we're we're a little bit far away. But it's just it's just incredible. It it is incredible. It's devastating to look at. To think something's been there since 1977. Actually, the anniversary just passed yeah, on the 24th. Yeah, a few, few days ago. So, you know, to think something's been there 40-plus years or whatever, I'm not good at math, so don't quote no, me No, 47 years, yeah. It's, um, it's just, it's hard to fathom, right? I mean, people are saying, yeah. even I think I heard the mayor say it's like something out of a movie. Yeah, I mean, it, it's exactly what it's like. Uh, one of my neighbors came up, and they said it was like an action movie, you know. It's something, you feel like you're in a in Hollywood, you know, you're not, it's not real, it's a dream, so. And sadly, it's real, and they're, you know, right now they're trying to save these people. Yeah, I mean, I hope I hope every single one of them's okay. I prayed for them, and I'll continue to pray until they're found or okay. So that's all we can do. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, again, we, we know that uh, the crews are uh, haven't been interviewed. They're still on the ship from what we understand. And we've been showing you this angle. I want to show it to you again, if you don't mind, just where we are in relation to the port. Um, and you can see the port is right next to us. So the dolly had left a little bit less than a half hour before the collision, left the port, went out into the Patapsco, and then didn't make it very far um, and rammed into one of those support piers. And that's where it sits right now. And that's where the rescue efforts are focused to try to make sure if there's anyone still alive in that water that they can they can get them out that they can they can save lives uh, again just an incredible scene here uh, from Baltimore County as we continue to digest the news that the key bridge collapsed this morning just around 1:30 this morning and Mike, as you indicated, we are now about almost six hours into this entire situation. And, of course, the emphasis from uh, the officials that we've been listening to uh, in that news conference is obviously on uh, search and rescue. Given the, the temperature, and you, you look pretty chilly there yourself, my friend, and it's got to be even more colder in the, in the water, uh, the chance of survival right now is, is, is dwindling by the moment, I would think. Well, and, you know, speed is paramount here that, uh, you know, if, if anyone's in there, they want to get them out as fast as possible. Uh, I mean, the good news is that we now have daylight, so that takes away one of the challenges. But uh, as you heard the fire chief say, they're dealing with the tide. Uh, there's low visibility in the water, but they're using a lot of technology, the infrared, the sonar. They have multiple crews there. They're all coordinating with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's just... It, it, 
a huge, it's a huge search and rescue effort, probably one of the largest that we've ever seen in Baltimore. And then you've also got that massive ship and you've got the big chunks of the bridge that are in the Patapsco that they've got to go around and, and, and uh, trying to pinpoint, you know, where, where those vehicles may be. And, uh, and also, you know, uh, the bridge is so high, 180 feet, and that's an incredible height to, to think that, you know, hopefully someone could survive a fall like that. But uh, it, it's just incredible to think about. And there's, so there's a lot of challenges ahead. The search and rescue is the number one. I'm sure this will also probably create a national conversation about infrastructure, and it's going to have a big impact on getting uh, goods around the East Coast and in and through Baltimore uh, for many, many, many months to come, Vic. It's definitely, and of course, one of the beautiful, beautiful things about living in an area like this where we have a lot of water uh, is the bridges are one of the things that add to the beauty, uh, but it also creates a problem when something happens on one it of those does. bridges. It, uh, it cuts off people in terms of transportation and being able to move about. And now we want to check in with Angela Foster, who's helping people, helping us navigate uh, this closure this morning. Uh, Angela, what's the latest? Well, Sina, we do know that uh, MDTA authorities quickly put detours in place for folks traveling through Dundalk or through the Curtis Bay Hawkins Point side of the bridge due to the bridge collapse. So 695, you'll have posted detours. So we have been suggesting the tunnels. Now, there'll be a lot of tractor trailers, unfortunately, will be prohibited from entering the harbor tunnel just because the height is just over 13 feet and only 8 feet wide. Now, the Fort McHenry Tunnel is a bit wider and a bit taller, but we'll have officials at all of these locations. This is the impact we're starting to see now. 95 southbound trying to get to the Fort McHenry Tunnel with a lot of the bailout traffic. Now, for folks who live in those neighborhoods, if you are on the Hawkins Point side or Curtis Bay side, we're being told that there's a pretty serious accident, unfortunately, Route 2 at 695, in addition to the fact that Run Arundel Expressway, Maryland 10, that's going to be the point where you are detoured off on the outer loop of I-695. We're expecting a lot of bailout traffic on Pennington Avenue. If you're joining us right now, you've been watching CBS News Baltimore. We are tracking developing news from Baltimore right now, where overnight a cargo ship we know crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing that bridge to collapse. You're looking at live images of the scene right now. More on this story coming up. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression, Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Good morning, I'm Chanel Call, in for Anne-Marie Green, and we begin this hour with some breaking news. A major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland has collapsed. This happened just before 1.30 a.m. A cargo ship crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending a huge section barreling into the water. The bridge, by the way, is more than half a mile and a half long. Officials gave an update just moments ago. We learned that two people have been rescued, and officials are also looking for at least seven people believed to still be in the water. A state of emergency has been declared in Maryland, sending multiple agencies to the response effort. Early witness reports say there was a fiery explosion before the collapse. I wanted to know what the bang was. Ship hit the key bridge, sinking. The bridge is gone. Officials described the ongoing search and rescue effort and the conditions of the area they're now searching. Joined this morning by our mayor, Brandon Scott, Council President Mosby, Councilwoman Porter, County Executive Johnny Oshevsky, and Baltimore County Fire Chief Joanne Rund. Um, our brief this morning will be an update on the search and rescue operation that's ongoing at this point. So at approximately 0140 hours this morning, our 911 center dispatched a call to the Baltimore City Fire Department for a report of a water rescue um, in the Patapsco River in the area of the Key Bridge. As units were responding, they began to receive numerous calls indicating multiple people in the water. At some point during that, that chain of events of calls, uh, we began to receive indications that a, uh, a ship may have struck the key bridge. We got further information through multiple calls that the key bridge, um, portions of the key bridge had actually collapsed. At about 0150 hours, our first unit arrived on scene and reported um, a complete collapse of the key bridge. Um, we were also given information at that time that there were likely multiple people on the bridge at the time of the collapse and that as a result, multiple people were in the water. We were able to remove uh, two people from the water. One individual refused service and refused transport. Essentially, that person was not injured. However, there was another individual that's been transported to a local trauma center that is in very serious condition. At this time, we have multiple air assets from the Maryland State Police, as well as the Baltimore Police Department, as well as multiple Marine assets from around the region, including Baltimore City, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, as well as multiple local and state police uh, agencies, uh, National Resources Police, um, BPD Special Ops Unit is in here, Maryland State Police is here. We have multiple resources. We are still very much in an active search and rescue posture at this point, and we will continue to be for some time. We have a large area that we have to search, this includes on the surface of the water, subsurface, as well as on the deck of the ship itself. We believe at this point, we may be looking for, we may be looking for upwards of seven individuals. That's the latest information we have. However, what I will say is, is the information that I'm giving you right now is as of right now. That's what we know right now. Um, this is a very large incident. It involves a very large footprint. 
multiple agencies are operating, therefore information is subject to change as we get more intel um, and as our crews work through the morning. Um, over the next eight to 12 hours, you can expect to continue to see um, our air and maritime assets functioning um, out on the water and in the air above. Um, we need to do damage assessment of, of the ship itself before we can board that ship. Um, and we need to continue our subsurface search, which is including um, different types of sonar. We have side scan sonar. We have other sonar capabilities here. We have underwater um, UAVs that we're working with. And throughout the night, we've also been working with uh, infrared technology, both from the air and on the water surface. So um, I'm gonna wrap up here with just saying, this continues to be a search and rescue operation. It continues to be a very dynamic operation with multiple local, state, and federal resources involved. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our mayor, Mayor Brandon Scott. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chief. And for more on this developing story, let's bring in Jared Hill, who's been following this since the news broke this morning. Uh, Jared, the good news here is we know two people now have been yeah. rescued from the waters, although officials are saying seven people are still being searched for and that number could rise. Yeah, that's right, Chanel. At least seven people at this point still being searched for. But they were mentioning here that, uh, again, we talked about this earlier this morning, that this all happened in the dead of night. It was 1.30 in the morning Eastern time when this collapse initially occurred. Uh, and so there are still questions about how many people might have been on the bridge itself. There are some uh, discussions about possible workers having been on the bridge. Uh, there's also the question about how many vehicles and how many people in each one of those vehicles were on the bridge. And so they're saying that there's the possibility that as the sunlight continues to rise, and those search and rescue teams are, are able to get a better glimpse at what's happening in the water. They potentially could find uh, more vehicles, more people that need to be rescued there. And another important piece of information here about how this may have happened coming mm -hmm. from officials this morning, Jared, uh, learning that there is, quote, absolutely no indication yeah. this was intentional. This is really important, Jared. Right, that's, that's so true because looking at this video from overnight, you have no clue as to why this vessel is going to uh, toward that the column on the bridge and then ends up hitting the column. But there is still the question about what exactly happened. While they're ruling out the idea that this was an intentional act, uh, there are still a ton of questions around all of this. And they were saying that one of the things they plan on doing, uh, again, as the sun starts to come up and they're able to get more access to the debris field in that area, is getting onto that ship, this ship that comes from uh, Singapore, um, and speaking with the crew that's on board, one thing that we've heard from the authorities is that at least as of now, no one on board uh, is reported injured, that all the people who were on board that ship uh, are still there. And so uh, getting a chance to get on, do some investigation there, seeing exactly what they might be able to ascertain uh, as to the damage on the ship and what might have caused this crash to begin with. It's something that they're going to be working on over the next uh, couple of hours here. They're also saying that this is going to be a very long, not just investigation, but cleanup process as well. This is a huge debris field. Again, remember, this bridge is about a mile and a half long. Um, this is a pretty big piece of real estate that they're dealing with. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of work going forward to just figure out what happened, who needs to be rescued and saved, and where do they go from here? Yeah, and Jared, an important point to make there about the sheer scale of this mm -hmm. collapse. It's going to have, no doubt, a really big impact on movement in the East yeah. Coast. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, exactly. And so there are a couple of things here. On one hand, there is the conversation about uh, the car traffic, right? This is a bridge that carries about 11 or so million people a year, um, a couple of, uh, you know, dozens of uh, tens of thousands of people a day. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of rerouting and, and whatnot that'll have to be happening with that. This is going to potentially cause some headaches throughout the uh, Baltimore, Washington, uh, Pennsylvania area as well, because this is a, a thoroughfare that is used by quite a lot of people. The other question uh, around all of this, and this is something that uh, I'm looking into right now, is what this might do for some of the cargo traffic going in and out uh, of the Baltimore Harbor. Again, this mm -hmm. is uh, a part of Baltimore that deals with a lot of that cargo traffic coming, not just into Baltimore itself, but potentially uh, coming into various parts of the Mid-Atlantic region, whether that's shipments of any kind. Uh, and so one of the questions is going to be, what will this 
crash and the ensuing investigation uh, have to, to do with potentially stopping up some of that activity as well. And Jared, you know, this was such a massive bridge. I wonder if we know any more about whether there's any further structural concerns there and how safe it is really for crews to be in the water and in the air around this. Yeah, so that's one of the questions uh, that we're also looking into what kind of structural concerns there are, at least based on the press conference that we heard from the uh, fire chief there. It seems as though those search and rescue teams are currently in the water and they're actively in the water. And it, it, it didn't sound as though there was a concern for um, any further structures falling into the water. But obviously they said this is all a very fluid and dynamic situation and they're assessing everything from the rising tide, which they're expecting to come in, uh, to the possibility that there could be some loose parts on other portions of the bridge that are still in place. And so all of that is something that they're keeping an eye on. And Jared, you know, we've been hearing from our friends at CBS News Philadelphia in their coverage. Some of the folks they've been talking to on the ground describing this loud boom that they heard overnight. Yeah, that's right. There were people who it's been interesting hearing kind of the combination of stories here. There was one man uh, who was speaking with our affiliate in Baltimore who said that he didn't hear anything but then saw the collapse and then you've other, heard other people say again they heard that loud boom um, because again looking at the video you can imagine what it sounded like when the cargo vessel hit that column and then when this massive mile and a half long bridge falls into the water just how quickly also it, it collapsed and fell into the water uh, as if this were made of nothing but then you think about the fact that so many people drive across that bridge every day. We have heard um, some response from uh, the Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg, saying that they are in contact with state, local, and federal authorities and officials uh, ready to help in any way that they can. This is also, though, potentially going to be something that comes up again as uh, the uh, president, President Biden, has really been focusing considerably on the issue of transportation and improving infrastructure across the country. Country. Um, and so that potentially could be a conversation piece going down the road as well. But right now, the big focus, especially for those crews on the ground, is the search and rescue operation that they are really just beginning. And we should mention as well, a state of emergency has been declared, which essentially means there are just more resources to exactly. respond to the scene. Um, I wanted to ask you, Jared, as well, about some of the technology that's being used in the search and rescue efforts, because we heard from some officials on the scene saying, you know, they're using sonar, they're using infrared tech. Yeah, exactly. And that sonar and infrared tech have been uh, really crucial, it sounds like, in figuring out, especially, again, in the darkness and in the water, how many vehicles there might be. They say that they've uh, been able to realize that there were multiple vehicles in the water because of that technology. Uh, they also said that they've had dozens of, of uh, various agencies on the scene there over the past couple of hours, in part because one agency might have some resources, some technology that another one doesn't, and that can help all in this uh, process. And so, so some of that huge response isn't necessarily because there are so many people they may be looking for in the water or so many things they're looking for in the water, but because each one of these agencies might have something different they can bring to the table that can help uh, make this search, rescue, and investigation go much more quickly and, and much more smoothly. Okay, and Jared, as we're speaking to you, we are getting some word from the White House this hour responding to this tragedy. I'll read you the statement that we just got into our newsroom this hour. The White House is closely monitoring the collision of a shipping vessel with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore that resulted in the collapse of that bridge. Our hearts go out to the families of those who remain missing as a result of this horrific incident. The U.S. Coast Guard is conducting search and rescue for those who remain unaccounted for as a result of the bridge collapse. Senior White House officials are in touch with the governor and mayor to offer any federal assistance they need. There is no indication of any nefarious intent. And Jared, I don't know if we still have you here, but this is that point we were making earlier. Again, this was not intentional. Now appears to be an accident, something that happened, uh, an, an explosion, potentially fiery explosion before the bridge collapsed. Right, that, that's exactly right. And that, uh, that note from the White House and from all these officials that we've been hearing that this does not at this point appear to be an intentional act uh, is uh, something, uh, an effort there to assuage any concerns 
in particular after we saw what happened uh, in, in Russia and, and sort of the climate that we are in now, there's always that concern that uh, wh whether something like this is an intentional act. But again, as we've been hearing from uh, the White House now, there is no indication that this was intentional. But there still are questions about what exactly happened and whether there were any uh, potential uh, signs of instability within the bridge itself. All of these things uh, are pieces that we and our teams here at CBS News are going to be investigating uh, in the hours, days, and weeks to come. Okay, Jared Hale live for us. Thanks so much. For more on this developing story, we want to bring in Kevin Cartwright, the Chief Public Information Officer for Baltimore Fire. Uh, Kevin, I know you're a very busy person today. Thanks for making time to speak with us. Now, we understand crews are searching from the air and the water this hour. Walk us through what's happening on the ground. The rescue effort's underway right now. Yes, we do have our uh, dive and rescue team um, deployed. Uh, as we have come into daylight right now, we uh, will begin to reassess and uh, determine exactly how we will most accurately and efficiently be able to uh, assess and identify who we have in the water, where these victims are, and how we'll best be able to get uh, to them. Um, we will be utilizing sonar um, equipment as well as infrared equipment to be able to identify their uh, are. So we have quite a bus this morning. Okay, and we know two people so far have been rescued. Seven potentially or more are still being searched for. Any updates on those numbers right now, Kevin? Actually, those numbers uh, remain the same uh, as I speak right now. And again, uh, the fact that we have daylight right now will better aid us in our ability to uh, be um, uh, successful, hopefully, and, and being able to identify and locate where these victims are. As uh, I'm not far from the water's edge, and I can see that there is um, a fair amount of a current coming through here. So the fact that this tide's coming through could certainly take those individuals' uh, bodies uh, away from where they initially may have gone into the water. So we have a few challenges ahead of us, but we have our dive rescue team members who are the, the most experienced and uh, efficient in and, and performing these types of tasks. So we're going to be relying heavily on them and their expertise. And, you know, Kevin, these images obviously just so dramatic. The devastation is so widespread. I'm wondering whether there are any further structural concerns for folks who are there, part of the rescue team on the ground and in the water. Well, certainly we are operating cautiously uh, with consideration that this uh, bridge has collapsed. So um, there's only so close that we'll be able to get to uh, these structures uh, with consideration that, hey, this bridge has just come down and we want to alleviate and avoid any adverse um, operating conditions for our, our rescue team members. Okay, Kevin Cartwright, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate this. You're quite welcome. We are following this story very closely. More on this coming up. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. 
an original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They give everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful. To keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Welcome back. We are following some developing news this morning. A major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland has collapsed. This happened just before 1.30 a.m. A cargo ship we know crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending a huge section barreling into the water. The video is dramatic. The bridge we can also report is more than a mile and a half long. Officials gave us an update moments ago. We learned there that two people have been rescued. Officials also say they are still looking for at least seven more people who they believe are in the water. A state of emergency has also been declared in Maryland, sending multiple agencies to the response effort. And right now we're waiting for another news conference from transportation officials there. In the meantime, let's take you live to CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole Skanga. Uh, Nicole, we know that people in the area have been saying they heard this loud boom this morning. What more are you hearing from folks on the ground? Yeah, folks hearing that loud boom and obviously that silhouette of the upended bridge. You can see behind me, officials are gathering now for a press conference. Behind them, police vehicles have shut down the surrounding highways to traffic. I think we're going to uh, hear now from officials who have the latest on uh, this cargo ship collision into the Francis Key Bridge. Let's take a live listen in. Joint Command News Briefing at the Key Bridge, I-695 in Baltimore, Maryland. I am going to introduce to you our Maryland Secretary of Transportation, Paul Wiedefeld. It's spelled P-A-U-L, Wiedefeld, W-I-E-D-E-F-E-L-D. -E -E Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> at approximately 1.30 a.m., a cargo ship leaving the Port of Baltimore struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge. This caused a catastrophic collapse of the bridge. First responders from the Maryland Transportation Authority, the Toll Authority, and our federal, state, and local partners immediately responded to the scene. At this time, this is an active search and rescue mission. We know there were, <clears throat> we know there were individuals on the bridge at the time of the collapse working on the bridge, contractors for us. Our partners from the U.S. Coast Guard will provide some more information momentarily. In terms of traffic, drivers should avoid I-695 Southeast Corridor and use I-95 I and I-895 as alternatives. I-695 is being detoured southbound at exit 43, the Peninsula Expressway, and northbound at exit 2, Route 10. Vessel traffic into and out of the port of Baltimore is suspended until further notice, but the port is still open for truck trans trans transactions. Obviously, we're very thankful for the first responders who are carrying out their efforts in these rescues and that, that, they're, that they're doing this all through the night and today. And we're praying, obviously, for everyone's safe return. We'll continue to provide updates to you. The next one being approximately 930. 
with that, with that, I will turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Palmer from the U.S. Coast Guard. Good morning. My name is Lieutenant Commander Aaron Palmer from Coast Guard Sector Maryland National Capital Region. I'm the current Acting Chief of Response for the sector. The Coast Guard's primary mission right now is search and rescue, looking for any survivors in the water. On scene, we currently have three small boats. We also have Coast Guard Cutter Mako, an 87-foot patrol boat. We have a helicopter from Air Station Atlantic City, and we're working with numerous federal, state, and local partners on scene on these search and rescue efforts. Thank you. you go ahead, Terry, any questions you have at this time? What role is the FBI playing in the investigation at this time? FBI has basically uh, to see if there's any terrorism connection, which there's not. Any confirmed people you're looking for? No confirmed fatalities. Any recovered from the water alive? Um, that's still under, um, still the rescue what mission is still active. Do you have any sense of what happened to the actual cargo ship? There were some reports that it suffered some major power outages just before it crashed into the ocean. Uh, Too early in the investigation. Was a pilot operating the ship coming in and out of the port? Was it a port authorized pilot or was it uh, the captain of the ship? No, the pilots uh, move ships in and out of the port of Baltimore. What's happening? Pilots move of ships in and out of Baltimore. What's happening to all the other ships that are waiting the backup at this point? How are you navigating that? Basically, we're we're communicating with them. They obviously understand the situation, and we'll uh, we'll deal with the logistics of that later. Has the crew uh, been evacuated from the ship, and has the Coast Guard been able to make contact with the pilot on the ship? That's all being done right now. Um, I don't know the exact details of where they all are, but yes, well, obviously we're contacting involved. them. Is this being investigated as suspicious? If it, in any type of incident like this, the FBI would be engaged just to make sure, and that's what they did. Any idea how many vehicles are in the water? Can you, can you, um, just any idea how could this happen? This bridge Too early. should not have collapsed like this. Too early investigation. Oh, could you how long will the port be closed? Do you know how deep the water is there and in sort of this area where it happened, the conditions? Approximately 50 feet. 50 plus 2. 50 feet. How many people are you looking for right now? That is still that is what we're doing. Um, we're we're basically searching for for everyone that was potentially on the bridge. As you can imagine, it's the middle of the night. You know, you know, what type of traffic was there? Uh, how many workers were there? Workers, you know, they obviously come to a project, but other workers show up sometimes. So that's what we're investigating right now. Is this unprecedented? Is it anything like this ever happened? Not in Baltimore. Sir, can you talk more about the workers on the bridge, what was going on, and how many vehicles you think might actually be in the water? They were, um, they were basically doing some concrete deck repair. Uh, we don't have the number of the vehicles. Do we know who they work for? Uh, I don't have that right offhand. How long will the port be closed? Any uh, too, too early to determine. Are you still looking for seven people? Um, a number of people. That's that's the one number that we've had. But obviously, we're gonna we're researching to see if anyone else was on that bridge. Can you speak to some of the challenges, the freezing water, the current, the darkness this morning as you were searching for individuals? All of all of the above, to be frank. Um, it's, you know, a very very tough situation. Uh, one you know one a.m. in the morning. Uh, very little information at that time. You know, it, it happened instantaneously, as you've seen. Sir, it's been a number of hours at this point. What can you tell family members who might be watching about any hope that you will still recover survivors? We actually have set up a, a facility for any family members. We have um, mental health professionals there as well, so we are dealing with that. And are you ruling out any kind of intentional uh, motive? That, that we don't see anything that, that uh, relates to that at this time. It's an, it's an open investigation, but there's nothing that points to that in any direction. First calls after the incident come in directly from the ship, when, when, the, when the ship hit there, who, was, who were the first ones to make the 911 calls to kind of alert you? I don't know. I don't have that information. Do you have any indication whether the ship lost power? Uh, it's too early. Uh, just for clarification, I'm last, sorry, port, last I, question, yeah. please. Port is closed except for trucks. Moving right, transport out. right, right, okay. right. Okay. Uh, we'll be back. We'll be back surely about 9:30. I'm sorry. Too early. Obviously, we reached out to a number of engineering you know, companies, and so obviously we have a, a, a long road in front of us to get to that point. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you tell us where family members are supposed to be now? 
Okay, we've been listening live to transportation officials who were on the scene of this massive bridge collapse in Baltimore. Again, this happened overnight. We also heard from the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, authorities now confirming there were some workers who were on the bridge when this happened. Uh, so they are looking into that. Notably, officials, again, they're ruling out anything suspicious. We will keep a close eye on this story. For now, we'll take a quick break. Our coverage continues after this. Right, shiny faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen. Because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, it! Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original, 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. The thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you have one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Good morning, I'm Chanel Call, in for Anne-Marie Green. And we begin this hour with some breaking news. A major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland has collapsed. This happened just before 1.30 a.m. in the overnight hours. A cargo ship we saw crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending a huge section barreling into the water. The bridge, by the way, is more than a mile and a half long. Officials moments ago gave us an update. We learned there that two people have been rescued, and officials say they're looking for at least seven more still believed to be in the water. A state of emergency has been declared in Maryland, sending multiple agencies to the response effort. And right now, we're also awaiting another news conference from transportation officials. We just heard from them again moments ago as well. I want to bring in CBS News transportation safety analyst Robert Sumwalt. Uh, he is also the former chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. Robert, you've been following all this since the overnight hours. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Certainly not to this magnitude. We have seen cases, very rare cases, where a ship might have run into the pilings of a, of a bridge, but nothing to this magnitude. And officials are saying, Robert, there was no indication this was intentional. So 
What's your take on how this may have happened? Well, certainly uh, there will be a very thorough investigation to look at that. The NTSB and the Coast Guard will be uh, conducting a, a very good investigation. What I did notice is that uh, right before the collision with the with the piling, there was a lot of uh, smoke uh, coming out of the smokestack of the cargo ship. And what that tells me is that the, the crew of the ship attempted to increase um, the, the power of the ship and increase the RPMs uh, which increases the uh, the steerability of the ship. So it appears that they were trying to avoid uh, hitting the pilings. Uh, that that I did find uh, to be very interesting. And what you're what you're saying is also in line with some reporting we're hearing that there was a fire on the vessel uh, that caused some kind of power failure on board the ship right before this crash happened. Talk us through what the next steps would be if that were the case. Well, uh, th that's a really good question. Uh, I think the, I do know this for a fact, is that the investigation will be extremely methodical. They've got a surviving crew. They've got a voyage data recorder, which has the uh, a lot of parameters from the ship. It has the voice uh, of, of the crew on the bridge of the ship. So um, they'll have a lot to go on. They, being the investigators, will have a lot to go on. Okay, Robert, and, and a good point there as well. I want to mention that the latest info that we have from Synergy Marine Group, the owner of the ship, is all crew members, again, including the two pilots, have been accounted for. No reports of any injuries on the actual cargo ship. Robert, thank you. Uh, for more on this story, let's now go to CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole Skanga. Nicole, the last time we chatted with you was just before we heard from transportation officials on the ground there, uh, and they confirmed that there were people who were actually working on the bridge when it collapsed. Hi there, Chanel. Uh, can you repeat your question? I'm sorry, you cut out for a moment. That's okay, Nicole. I know things are fluid there. The last time we spoke to you, we were just about to hear from transportation officials. Let's just walk people through what we heard from them and also pointing out that there were people who were working on the bridge when it collapsed. Yeah, that's right. Just moments ago, we heard from local officials here in Baltimore, as well as the U.S. Coast Guard, who indicated there were some construction workers who were reportedly working on the bridge, laying concrete when the collapse began at approximately 1.30 a.m. earlier this morning. I also asked officials about whether or not they've made contact with the crew. They said that those conversations are now underway. Uh, we have heard from the owner of the ship, the Dolly, uh, who says that all of the crew, including the two pilots, are accounted for, and remarkably, no one was injured. Now, officials earlier did tell us they have pulled two individuals from the water, that coming from the Baltimore Fire Department here. One of those individuals uninjured, another in serious condition and transported to a local uh, trauma center. And I want to ask about the search and rescue efforts on the ground, Nicole. We're learning that there is a lot of technology that's part of this effort. That's right, sonar, infrared, and part of that is because a lot of this search was first conducted uh, under the cloak of darkness. And speaking to local officials just now, they spoke to uh, just how little information there was at 1.30. They arrived on the scene, uh, started trickling in at 1.50 a.m. Dozens of agencies, local, state, federal. Now that the sun is rising, those uh, search and rescue efforts are going to be ramping up. The U.S. Coast Guard has a number of uh, marine and air assets, helicopters, uh, at least three small ships and some larger assets. We do know that as of now, there is no traffic coming into uh, the port or leaving the port uh, as this search and rescue effort continues. Uh, but we do know that there are still transactions happening here in the port of Baltimore. We did ask officials for updates on the number of vehicles that are still submerged in the water. They say they're still trying to figure it out. But again, to that technology you spoke to, they were able to confirm that there were multiple uh, vehicles that dropped from the bridge, including at least one tractor trailer now trying to, uh, you know, carefully uh, do search and rescue efforts. And, and they're searching along the surface of the water. They're searching underneath uh, underwater. They're also searching the deck of the ship. Keep in mind, this is a massive ship, uh, 970 feet lo long uh, and 161 feet wide. 
Uh, so they're they're right now trying to figure out if they can uh, land assets on the ship, uh, how the best way to get the crew off would be. Okay, Nicole Skanga, thanks so much. And for more on this developing story, let's bring in our Caitlin Huey Burns, who's at the White House this hour. We just got this statement from the Biden administration earlier this hour. Caitlin, walk us through how the administration's responding to this. Hey, Chanel, as you can imagine, they are monitoring this very closely. Uh, we got a alert earlier this morning. The top line from state, the statement from White House officials is that there is no indication of nefarious intent. They mm -hmm. are working closely with uh, the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, of course. And uh, we have also heard from Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who said that his administra his uh, team is working closely with uh, the governor um, and rescue efforts remain underway. The U.S. Coast Guard, of course, is also conducting search and rescue. Uh, the big question, too, is what Biden will do. He is scheduled to depart later this afternoon for a, a trip to North Carolina, where he will be going with Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, so far, that trip is still uh, scheduled to go on as planned. Uh, but essentially, uh, the White House here is in close contact uh, with local and federal officials. And Caitlin, I don't know if you can answer this question right now, but we know, of course, a state of emergency has been declared. I'm just wondering from the statement that Biden sent out, from the White House sent out, it says that they're willing to offer any federal assistance to the mayor and the governor if needed. What might that look like? That's right. Westmore declared a state of emergency in Maryland, and uh, the White House says that they are closely coordinating uh, with him. Uh, of course, they have close contact anyway. They have a close relationship. So uh, whether this requires any sort of federal uh, assistance uh, remains to uh, be seen in terms of what additional assistance is needed. The White House was uh, clear today, of course, that the U.S. Coast Guard is involved. And uh, we're waiting to hear more also from the uh, transportation department as well, which is, uh, you know, overseeing these efforts. Okay, Caitlin Huey Burns live for us at the White House. Thanks so much. And we are continuing to follow this developing story from Baltimore this hour. We'll take a quick break and be right back. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. It can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. 
A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming Cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And we are following breaking news this hour out of Maryland. This is where a cargo ship crashed into a major bridge, causing it to collapse, sending cars and people flying into the water. Our coverage continues with CBS News Baltimore. Uh, so there are just so many people impacted by this. Uh, and it's really just something that they, when you look outside, a lot of people who live on this side of the, uh, in the Anne Arundel County side, uh, of their vantage point. They're so used to seeing this key bridge every single time they wake up, uh, look out into the water, into the distance, and now that's no longer. So it's just, uh, it's taken a lot of people back. Um, people, again, showed up in, in tears, just in such shock. Uh, so that just paints a picture on how this tragedy, this unthinkable tragedy has impacted this community and beyond. All eyes really right now focused on Baltimore. Uh, but the focus, of course, officials have said is recovery efforts, praying for all those people, families impacted by this, and the first responders who have been out here since that first call uh, trying to rescue everybody. Now we, this is a multi-state agency uh, response. We've seen crews from Anne Arundel County, Howard County, PG County, uh, many, many uh, agencies coming out here to assist with their rescue boats. Um, as far as the cargo ship that we've learned collided with the key bridge. Uh, we were told that no one on board was injured, uh, but they are contacting uh, through the Coast Guard. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, as far as recovery efforts in the water, uh, they were battling darkness for many hours, but right now the, the, the sun is out. So, um, that is kind of on their side, but they are also working against time. But, um, we are also wanted to share some sound of, of community members who arrived on scene here. So take a listen. I, I drive a lot, right? Okay. I was in my driveway and my granddaughter showed me the picture of the bridge collapsing. I went down the other place to see and I couldn't see and I was going to come here and see. But it's surprising. It's just yeah. the bridge she just collapsed. I was there not even not, yesterday. I took the people home on the other side of Key Bridge. They live in Dundalk. And to see the bridge gone, knowing I was on the bridge about even 10, 10 hours ago, it's devastating and because I could have been there. Yeah, just so, so hard to take in. Yeah, people travel this. This just goes to show this is a very well-traveled uh, road, bridge. Thousands of people travel across this bridge every single day. I travel across it literally every single week. So this is just very impactful throughout the community. Um, again, we were told from uh, officials that this is over the next 8 to 12 hours. You can expect to see crews out here as uh, recovery efforts are underway. Again, this is just a long road ahead and we'll of course keep you updated as soon as we learn more we'll send it back to you guys for now thank you very much of course uh, with the story that we've been following all night long uh, since it first happened this morning around 1 30 or so uh this bridge collapse uh over the tapsco river uh the Kip francis scott key bridge of course uh we are a big transportation area uh a lot of commuters uh, a lot of people who need to, uh, to get from point a to point b uh, via their cars we're checking now with angela foster has been monitoring traffic for us and giving us some alternate routes 
Thank you, Vic. On the roads right now, I will tell you the impacts that are being felt are mostly going to be for folks who live in the neighborhoods surrounding the bridge. But, of course, the impacts are going to be held for folks who travel through the interstates and head through Baltimore. A lot of people who travel 95, especially trans, uh, traveling with those tractor trailers, they normally take the key bridge because they are prohibited from going into the tunnels. But with the bridge collapse, our number one alternate route we are suggesting is that you head through the city, 95 and Interstate 895, as your alternate routes. If you happen to get caught on that side of the bridge through Dundalk, not knowing, you'll be detoured to the Peninsula Expressway, where we're already seeing some color on our map with the bailout route, North Point Boulevard, Broning Highway, as well as Dundalk Avenue, also going to be carrying a lot of bailout traffic. Now, if you're on the Anne Arundel uh, County side, heading through Curtis Bay, Maryland 10, the Arundel Express, way. That's going to be your point of entry and exit. If you're traveling on 10, they're going to detour you onto the inner loop, of course. And if you're on the outer loop, they're going to take you off of 695 and you'll get on Maryland 10 southbound. So we're already starting to see some backups in that area. Now, the problem with getting into the Harbor Tunnel, you may see MDTA officials there stopping some of these tractor trailers because those in excess of 13 feet 6 inches in height or eight feet wide will be prohibited from entering the harbor tunnel. And we are seeing a lot more delays now for those traveling on 95 into the Fort McHenry tunnel. So just be prepared, giving you a live look as we step away here. This is 95 southbound already seeing delays out of Rosedale toward that Fort McHenry tunnel. Okay, thank you very much. And of course, uh, information is coming in from uh, a number of different areas. We have a, a tweet right now yeah, that uh, came in from Dave Statter. Right? Yes, we're monitoring reactions on uh, social media. Here's sort of an image of, uh, of where this crash happened. You can see a picture of the vessel, the, uh, the dolly that we've been talking about all morning as well. Uh, Dave has been talking about uh, just sort of the exact um, stats and figures regarding this vessel. Uh, he said early, uh, let's see, let's get to the latest here. Uh which is impossible for us to read on the screen. I'm right just going to get a bit closer so we can read it here. He says, key up, uh, bridge update four. Here's more on the container ship that struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, bridge via vessel finder. Uh, we can see uh, some of sort of the stats there on the on the left of your screen. Gross tonnage there, 95,128 built in 2015. Um, some more stats about the bridge as well. And uh, apparently it was... Uh, not going very fast, obviously, it's the speed zero knots. I mean, it was basically just kind of coasting at the time that this actually occurred. Uh, and uh, this, uh, it didn't take very much in terms of them, this massive ship hitting that uh, that pylon and bringing down the bridge. Uh, Dave Statter, of course, uh, giving us additional information there on the dolly, uh, the ship that you, the container ship that you see right there, uh, and uh, the fact that it is uh, caused devastating damage uh, to the uh, Key, Francis Scott Key Bridge, uh, completely collapsing. Rest, search and rescue efforts underway at this very moment. The Coast Guard with multiple uh, vehicles and ships in the water right now, searching along with um, some from very uh, a number of uh, different agencies around Baltimore. Uh, just about every surrounding county has sent personnel here to help out. And we understand Governor Westmore is now at the site uh, of this bridge uh, uh, at this collapse now. We mentioned earlier that he sent a statement declaring a state of emergency here in Maryland. He is now in Baltimore attending to the scene of this collapse. Yes, and of course, uh, we're seeing some uh, mist there on top of the uh, uh, the lens of the helicopter. Uh, I don't think we have any precipitation in the area right now. Uh, that looks like just probably moisture coming from um, uh, a number of other possibilities there. Let's check in now with Meg McNamara uh, to bring us up to date on the conditions that these uh, first responders are operating in right now. And we, 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 our camera's moving around. We're going to get you right over to Meg. Meg? We'll get to her shortly. Yes, thank you. So 
So no. we know that, you know, this is such a huge area for the crews to be dealing with. So we don't have a full look at the picture, but this dove does give us a pretty good idea. We actually have a weather station on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. So this is really giving us some idea. Of course, working against the crews were the fact that they had to do the first five hours of this rescue in the dark because we didn't get that sunrise until 6:59. Of course, now the sun is up. There is plenty of daylight. That is a definite positive. The temperatures, though, also working against these rescue crews. We're talking about water temperatures in the mid to upper 40s in this area. So that is devastatingly cold, obviously extremely dangerous. As for the winds, so northeast right around 15 knots. We have seen some gusts up to 20 in that area. And we heard from Fire Chief Wallace that the rising waters, the rising tide was working against them. And that is the case because we're actually looking at the Next high tide in just about 30 minutes at 820 this morning. Then we'll start to see those tides starting to fall. But the timing obviously working against those rescue crews. And again, we got a little bit of daylight starting at 632 this morning. But the first five hours pretty much in total darkness working against these crews. Now, one positive is that we don't have fog. We know obviously this is an all hands on deck situation. People are searching by air and by water, so it doesn't look like there's any fog that would be diminishing visibility as far as that goes, so that is a positive. We certainly have a lot of clouds out there. Some of those clouds are, lo are low, but none low enough to really prohibit visibility in that way, but certainly the temperatures are very concerning. We're just grateful, though, that we do have daylight now. And, of course, we are going to be keeping an eye on the changing conditions in this area, and we will keep you posted. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much. And now we want to go back to Mike Helgren in the Turner Station area of Baltimore County. Mike, you've been talking to so many people who are impacted by this in one way or another. Yeah, and it drew quite a crowd here, and many people were jolted awake because there was such a harsh collision when the ship hit the bridge and then when the bridge collapsed. Uh, it felt like an earthquake to a number of people here, got them out of bed. A lot of them looked on social media. Some of them actually came outside in the dark to see what was going on. Just uh, a lot of them saw that incredible video of the bridge collapsing within seconds. And we've been getting updates throughout the morning from various officials. There were two news conferences, one with Baltimore's mayor and the Baltimore County Executive, and another with state officials and the MDTA. Let's listen to what the state had to say. In terms of traffic, drivers should avoid I-695 Southeast Corridor and use I-95 I and I-895 as alternatives. I-695 is being detoured southbound at exit 43, the Peninsula Expressway, and northbound at exit 2, Route 10. Vessel traffic into and out of the port of Baltimore suspended until further notice, but the port is still open for truck trans trans transactions. The Coast Guard's primary mission right now is search and rescue, looking for any survivors in the water. On scene, we currently have three small boats. We also have Coast Guard Cutter Mako, an 87-foot patrol boat. We have a helicopter from Air Station Atlantic City. And it is a delicate operation, this search and rescue operation, again, trying to find out how many more people may be in the water, working against time. Working and you've been streaming CBS News Baltimore's coverage of a major bridge collapse in Maryland. Our coverage continues next. We'll take a quick break. You're streaming CBS News. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. 
I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm gonna use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Good morning, I'm Chanel Call in for Anne-Marie Green and we begin this hour with some breaking news. A major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland has collapsed. This happened just before 1.30 a.m. A cargo ship was seen crashing into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending a huge section barreling into the water. The bridge is more than a mile and a half long, and officials earlier this hour gave us an update. We learned there that two people have so far been rescued, and officials say they're also looking for seven more believed to still be in the water. Right now, multiple agencies are responding to this and assisting in the search and rescue effort. Jared Hill joins me now with more on this. Jared, you've been following this all morning. The search now is obviously on for survivors. Mm -hmm. Want to ask about weather conditions there first, because we're hearing from crews on the ground that they're dealing with this tide coming in. Yeah, that's right. So there are a number of weather issues uh, centered around the search and rescue mission that are making this a bit more uh, difficult, Chanel. So one is the fact that the tide is coming in. Another is that the water there is cold. Uh, and on top of that, the air is cold as well. And these crews have been searching in and around this water for the past, uh, you know, six or so hours at this point and so fatigue uh, it beginning to set in one of the things though that has been helpful is the fact that the sun at least is coming up allowing them to to at least see a bit better uh, whether there are any people any vehicles uh, in the area also remember that as they were dealing with this search and rescue operation they were also having to navigate around whatever debris might have fallen into the river there in Baltimore and so doing so in the dark they really were heavily relying on uh, sonar in, in radar and whatnot to try and see uh, in the water the things that they could not see with their own eyes. As the sun is coming up, even though the water is still murky there, uh, that is going to help this effort at least somewhat. And I want to ask you, Jared, about the status of operations at the port. It is it is it now completely shut down? What's the impact? 
Right, so what we've been hearing is that it is shut down, although there apparently is some truck traffic that's being allowed to, to come in in various uh, ways around the port, obviously not along this bridge. Um, but this is causing a, uh, a significant bottleneck uh, in, in that region around Baltimore and that port. As for cause, we still don't know exactly how this happened, but we are right. getting some information, Jared, from officials about what didn't happen. Yeah, that's right. So we don't know the cause of this. And in fact, the owner of that ship has put out a statement saying that uh, they're still investigating the cause as well. But all the, the crew members aboard that ship have been accounted for. What the White House and other officials have confirmed at this point, though, is that this does not appear to have been an intentional act. They're not investigating this as uh, any sort of act of terrorism or anything like that. It seems as though this was accidental in some capacity. But again, the big question is, what happened uh, in the moments leading up to this crash and, and exactly why did this happen to begin with? Mm -hmm. And for that perspective, I want to bring in CBS News transportation safety analyst Robert Sumwalt. He is the former chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, Robert, thank you again for joining us. You know, what stands out to me when you watch this video is it happens so quickly, this massive bridge coming down in just a matter of seconds. Does that tell us anything about what might have led up to this moment? Well, there are some uh, clues from that video. Uh, we noticed that uh, if, if we back it up, and we can't at this point, but uh, the lights of the ship actually flash off. They go off, and then a few seconds later, they come back on. That would indicate uh, a, an electrical power failure. Uh, then we notice black smoke coming out of, out of the smokestack. And so uh, that's telling me that probably the ship's uh, crew is trying to increase the RPMs across the, uh, across the uh, propeller to increase the steering capability of it. So I think we're already getting some clues uh, out of this video. What kind of infrastructure, Robert, exists on this ship that's going to help answer those questions in the days and weeks following? Well, there's a, first of all, you have a surviving crew. So that's uh, one very good resource right mm -hmm. there. The ships also have a voyage data recorder, which records the audio of those conversations on the bridge, the ship's bridge, that is. Uh, so it's, you're going to hear the, uh, the investigators will hear the conversations that's going on on the ship's bridge. Uh, we'll also have the voyage data recorder also records various parameters like the, the steering angle of the rudder and things like that. So there, there'll be a lot of information to help piece this back together. And Robert, for people who are just joining us now, I want to walk us through uh, the vessel itself. What do we know about this cargo ship and where was it heading? Good question. I'm not uh, privy to that. I'm really focusing on the investigative details of it, so I don't have that information. Okay, and I just want to sum up again, because we did get this information from Synergy Marine Corp uh, group, that is, that 22 people who were part of that crew all of them have been accounted for. All of them are safe. Um, Robert, who is leading this investigation and what happens next? Well, uh, the discussions uh, will be going on right now between the NTSB and the Coast Guard to see who will lead the investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, but both of those organizations will actually be involved heavily in this uh, investigation. And let's talk about the location as well, because that's notable. This is the nation's ninth busiest port. Can you talk a bit, Robert, about the impact on the area? There are going to be some major disruptions, I imagine. Yeah, it's hard to tell exactly how long this port will be closed, but you are exactly right. This is going to shut down that port as far as the seaport aspects of it. It still has trucking capability in and out, but uh, the, the vast majority of the containers are moved by, by, uh, by ship, and that's not going to happen for a while. And give us some information, if you have it, on this bridge. Yeah, I don't have a lot of information on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know that it's uh, over 50 years old. It's a very historic bridge. Uh, uh, and the other um, um, accesses, are the access across the uh, the uh, the channel there is um, is limited by this bridge, which has now collapsed, mm -hmm. and two tunnels. So this is a key uh, part of the infrastructure. Okay, lots to follow here. And we also know that this is a multi-agency incident. So there are a couple of different teams here who are involved in this effort as well as the investigation. Robert Samal, thanks so much. And we're also learning this hour more about the impact of this. We know this is hitting the community very hard. 
We also know at this point 22 people who are part of that crew, they have all safely been rescued. They're accounted for. No reports of any injuries there. Earlier this morning, police did say, uh, authorities on the scene did say that two people were rescued from the water. They don't know at this point, or at least they can't reveal to us, how many cars were on the bridge when the bridge itself collapsed. They do say, though, they've got air crews, they've got water crews who are searching for at least seven people. Again, though, some reports there could be as many as 20, but at this point, officials are saying at least seven people are still being searched for. Certainly, the search for survivors continues. And as we've been hearing from our reporters on the ground, Weather conditions are hampering that search. It's difficult because the tide is impacting the search, the water is cold, but at least we have some daylight now. So they're hoping to learn more about what may have happened and search for those survivors as the day goes on. Joining me now is Donald Heinbeck. He is a witness to this collapse. Uh, Donald, thank you for being with us. I imagine this has been just such an emotional and difficult day for you and so many others in this community. Tell us a bit about what you saw and heard this morning. Uh, good morning. Um, we were awakened by what sounded like a rolling thunder coming through, and it, it felt like an earthquake. When the bridge came down, it did uh, crash into the water, and it made uh, quite a noise, and it did create a, a vibration that went through the community. This community where I live is the closest community to the bridge, so it's actually right behind me. Um, and I had previously been a chief of operations in Baltimore City for the fire department. So I turned on my uh, radio and found out where the incident uh, was going on. And I, I went to the, to the scene where the command post was being set up to watch that uh, ensue. And um, uh, just got caught up into watching that. But as far as the impact, a lot of the people here can't get to work uh, over the Key Bridge. And they're going to have to take detours uh, several miles out of their normal route. I just wonder, especially because of your experience with the fire department, Donald, have you seen anything like this before? Uh, several times uh, we had a, a train explosion and derailment in the Howard Street Tunnel in downtown Baltimore uh, some years back, uh, and that created an um, uh, impact on the economic uh, ability of the, of the city. But uh, this this is a whole different animal, and um, yet yeah, very serious. It's it's, but it's something that we actually train for. We train for things like this, and the uh, multi agency response and the way the teams came together was very impressive. Very impressive. And can you talk about how the community is responding? I imagine you know it must be quite a frantic feeling to wake up and to see and hear about something like this, as you say, just down the road from your home. Well, we depend on the media to help us out and to tell us the uh, best routes to take uh, to uh, detour around the uh, the emergency up there. And um, I, I think the media's done a pretty good job on that, having you know been been through these experiences before. But the media played a, a big part in getting the information out to the folks who have to go to work. So uh, I think it's even though it's it's really a, a disaster up there. Uh, I think in, people are dealing with it uh, in a very reasonable way, responsible way, and in many ways, the ways that we're trained to deal with things. And, you know, you mentioned a bit about the location here. I want to ask more about that. There is the bridge. There is also the port. These two are very, as I understand, important areas, not just to the local community, but the greater economy. Yeah, so we have uh, two cruise ships to go in and out of Baltimore. So there are two cruise ships that are coming back to where we're not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And the backup, the um, marine traffic has already taken place. Uh, if you go onto any of the marine mapping uh, sites, you'll see where the, the um, ships are just backing up in the bay. They have to make turns, go back to another port. So it's, and rails, rail lines are affected. And hazmat, uh, the hazmats that are going through the Baltimore area has to take a detour uh, around the Baltimore Beltway as opposed to going over the Key Bridge. So that puts a lot of time and expense into their um, operations. And I wonder, Donald, because you seem like you're very active in the community. You said you have this experience with the fire department. You know, did people come out of their homes in the middle of the night when this happened? Were you getting phone calls? 
Walk me through what was happening as soon as you found out. Well, I guess I'm an exception to the rule. I, I have a, a radio that I can listen to mm -hmm. on the fire. So I, I know exactly where to go. But it's kind of in a remote area as as far as uh, residences are concerned. Uh, okay. It's an industrial area. Uh, on this side, now this is the, um, what would be the south or west side of Anne Arundel County. But Baltimore County is a little different. It may be uh, for residents on that side. But again, Baltimore County is severely impacted. The uh, Old Spires Point has been really developed with a lot of uh, industry. So all those workers, many of them are affected adversely with their um, travel in, in, in the morning or in the afternoon. I just so, wonder. Yeah, tremendous impact. Yeah, yeah. Donald, I just wonder before we let you go, how you feel looking at this happen? I mean, miles away, you look at these dramatic images and it is just so shocking to your core. How does it feel to just be so close to something like this? Well, I, again, I have a different perspective. I look at it, I look at it from someone who's been trained to deal with it, mm -hmm. and I was impressed with the response and the way people came together. And I look at things like the media. Again, the media's been doing a great job in keeping us informed. So as much as we can do to mitigate the problems associated with the incident, I think we're doing okay. But again, the investigation has to go forward to find out what happened and how we can prevent situations like this from occurring again. Mm -hmm. it's just, we, we just can't have these things happen. Absolutely. Donald, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We understand there's a lot going on, so we appreciate it. And stay with us. More coverage continues. We're going to take a quick break. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. National security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discoveries, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app.
America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Welcome back. We are following some developing news that began overnight in Baltimore. A bridge has collapsed there and search and rescue efforts are still underway. For more on this developing story, we go live to CBS News Baltimore. Treatment is expected to be okay. Another person is in tra the trauma center, local, uh, the local trauma center, and is uh, at last check in serious condition. We have not heard any updates. Uh, that was from around 6.30 this morning. We've also heard that number of people the uh, recovery efforts are for. Uh, it's fluctuated throughout the morning, but we were told they were looking for upwards of seven individuals, uh, but they have confirmed that multiple vehicles and a group of construction workers uh, were on the bridge at the time of the collapse around 1.30 this morning. Uh, we have seen kind of the crowd dwindle down uh, right now, but earlier this morning, as soon as those pictures were posted on social media, videos uh, posted on social media and all our news alerts have been pushed out, we saw a lot of community members arrive here on scene. I know this side, uh, we can't actually get as good of a vantage point as um, you may on the other side where Alexis Davila is, uh, but we're about still about a mile away from seeing anything, uh, any remnants of the bridge, but uh, along this area, the people from Riviera Beach, Pasadena, they still heard uh, that boom. They say they heard what at the time of the collapse and some people on the other side in Dundalk uh, even reported they felt the uh, shaking in the house. So uh, that startled people enough for them to come out here and uh, just try to make sense of what happened. Uh, a lot of people, it's just really hard to take in and see those images in that video. Uh, people have grown up, taken this route through the bridge every single day uh, for the for for many years, for the past nearly 50 years. Um, we're hearing more first responders arrive. I'm not sure if, yes, they are coming through right now. So this has kind of been the scene throughout the morning. First responders, uh, anyone is uh, asked to avoid, of course, using this area, take alternate routes uh, throughout the morning and for the days and months uh, to follow. Um, but we did hear an update uh, about an hour or a few minutes ago from MDTA, so we want to toss it to that sound for now. In terms of traffic, drivers should avoid I-695 Southeast Corridor and use I-95 and I-895 as alternatives. I-695 is being detoured southbound at exit 43, the Peninsula Expressway, and northbound at exit 2, Route 10. Vessel traffic into and out of the port of Baltimore is suspended until further notice, but the port is still open for truck trans trans transactions. And we were told at last check with Baltimore County Chief James Wallace that you can expect to see crews out here for several hours, up to 12 hours, uh, as recovery efforts are underway. Uh, officials, Baltimore City uh, exec, uh, Mayor Brandon Scott, County Executive John Yoshevsky, uh, both expressed their condolences, just really saying right now thoughts and prayers are with uh, any individuals, families impacted by this, uh, as we hope to recover as many uh, people in bodies as we can because uh, we are working against time as of now. But uh, for now, we'll send it back to you guys in studio. Okay, thank you very much. This is a good time for us to start uh, thinking again once uh, once more about uh, traffic in the area uh, and how this entire situation is affecting how things are developing out there. Let's go to Angela Foster right now in the traffic center. 
Thank you, Vic. I will tell you, as we were talking about off air, it is spring break week, so likely we're not seeing our usual gridlock just for our local travelers here in Baltimore. But with this closure, what we are seeing now, though, are the impacts of our bailout routes. Of course, we are suggesting, since you cannot use the Key Bridge, go through the city, take 95, 895, and hit the tunnels. Well, this is what you are up against at this hour. A live look here at Interstate 895 at Eastern. Now, as you can see, the pace is very slow and we're already starting to experience the gridlock. I am imagining this is what 895 southbound is going to look like from this point moving forward. We may have some breaks in this through the midday. 95 is also experiencing that, but 895, part of your delays are due to the fact that MDTA officials are there stopping some of these tractor trailers. There are restrictions for the height and width are certain of certain vehicles with the Harbor Tunnel. More of them are going to be able to access the Fort McHenry Tunnel here on 95, where you can see the yellow on our map with that very so slow pace. Now, if you're traveling on 695 and you happen to come through Dundalk and you're aware, unaware, or if you live in that area, you're going to have to take the posted detour, which is the Peninsula Expressway. But we are also anticipating that some of our other roadways not far away are going to be dealing with that bailout traffic on Browning Highway, North Point Boulevard, Dundalk Avenue, coming from that side of the bridge. Over here on the Curtis Bay side, it is Maryland 10, the Arundel Expressway. That's the bailout route for the posted detour. And for folks traveling northbound through Anne Arundel County, you're going to be detoured from 10 to the inner loop, of course, because the outer loop is closed with the bridge closer. Just wanted to give you another live look. This is 95 and what we are experiencing already for that southbound drive of folks trying to get into the Fort McHenry Tunnel with the bailout traffic. Angela, thank you very much. And uh, I guess another question we have for you real quickly here is that are you surprised that the situation is not worse in other parts of your map? I saw a lot of green around there. Uh, I quite honestly was, was concerned thinking that we we're going to see a lot of red out there on your map this morning. Vic, I am actually very surprised. Uh, again, the only thing I can think of is it is spring break week. And I know personally, I know a lot of people who took off work this week simply because their kids were on spring break. Right. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for staying on top of it for us. We're going to look at some of the statistics for the uh, Port of Baltimore, which set records and has been breaking records since it opened. This comes from Governor Moore back in February. This is back in February. 52.3 million tons of foreign cargo moving through the Port of Baltimore. $80.8 billion in foreign cargo value. And we're talking about 11.7 uh, million tons of general cargo. These were the numbers for 2023. We've also been talking about the jobs, 15,000 jobs in the Port of Baltimore, and then 139,000 jobs connected to the Port of Baltimore. We've been, I mean, just highlighting how expansive the impact of all of this is. Right, and you think about the the, the impact. You, we, we see this. We, we understand what's going on with the ships and so forth. But there are a lot of people who aren't going to be able to work, I guess, at this point. And that means that they aren't going to be able to stop at the little mom and pop sandwich shops, yep. the convenience yep. stores, uh, that type of thing that's surrounding that area right there that, that provides tremendous support uh, to the people who are, are working in, uh, in these jobs uh, in, in and around the Port of Baltimore. And speaking of, we do want to check back in with uh, Mike Helgren, who's been in the Turner Station area all morning, speaking to people who live by this, who saw all this happen, who are so impacted by this collapse, Mike. And we have one more to talk to. Uh, first, uh, minor updates. We heard from the FAA that there's a no-fly zone for drones because they don't want them interfering with the rescue efforts. Also, uh, we heard from Congressman Dutch Ruppersberger, who's represented the area for several decades, and he says that the Transportation Secretary, Federal Highway Administration, and the NTSB are going to be here on scene very soon. I am joined live with Giorgio. He lives in the community. And you were saying you live several blocks away. We've been hearing from people who were just woken up because of the, the sound and the rumble of the collapse. Describe to me what it was like for you. Well, it was very unnerving. Uh, I thought it was perhaps a low-flying plane, uh, military style, or, or however unlikely, perhaps a, a small earthquake here in Baltimore. But it certainly woke me up. It shook my house. And uh, it's just 
really a terrible tragedy. Um, I take that bridge regularly, and to have just seen how quickly it collapsed is incredibly unnerving, incredibly scary, and uh, my heart goes out to the people of Baltimore. The first responders, the rescue workers, we're praying for them. Yeah, it, what's in your heart when you think about people who were just driving and went right into the water? I, I can't even imagine, um, you know, it's one of these scenarios. I, my heart just goes out to their loved ones. I'm praying for them. I know there's a window of time. That's what I'm understanding from the news reporting. Uh, where they can be rescued, and, and I really, really pray that, that they are found and go home safe to their families. All right, you've been but, watching uh, our continuing coverage from CBS News Baltimore. This is where a major bridge collapsed earlier this morning. Our coverage continues after this. We've got to take a quick break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast, real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Stay with us. We are following developing news right now. Again, a major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland has collapsed overnight. A cargo ship crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending a huge section barreling into the water. We learned two people have been rescued, but officials say they're still looking for seven people believed to be in the water. 
Right now, multiple agencies are responding to this and assisting in the search and rescue effort. So joining us now on the phone with more on this story is Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. Uh, thanks so much for being with us, Mr. Mayor. I imagine this must be an incredibly difficult morning for you, for your entire community. First of all, how are you? Well, I'm as good as can be. This is it's not about me. It's about uh, those families that are directly impacted in the community that is having an unspeakable tragedy unfold right before their eyes. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Let's start with the latest on the ground. Any updates on the number of people rescued there? No, same number, still two, and we're still looking for, for uh, those seven individuals, um, and that's what the focus is for us. So this is an active search and rescue uh, that we're going to continue. Uh, we are we're first and mainly concerned about those souls uh, that we know that are in the water and everything else is secondary to that. Okay, and can you speak a bit about the impact on the community this morning and your role in all of this? We understand there are multiple agencies working in tandem on this search and rescue effort. Yeah, listen, this is this is not just a city of Baltimore effort. I just uh, was on site. Uh, our governor came on site uh, to the search and rescue. Uh, everybody's working together, city, state, uh, federal folks, local folks, uh, county folks are here supporting my good uh, friend and colleague, County Executive Oshesky, who has been with us. Everybody's working together to try to save lives because that's what matters right now. Okay, and we are just getting some new information this hour, Mayor, uh, about what officials believe may have happened. The boat, the ship that is, lost propulsion before this bridge collapsed. Can you confirm this? Do you have any additional details around this? I cannot confirm. All of that is still in, 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 it's a part of the open investigation. Uh, there will be the time for us to go, to go through and dissect every single moment and put that timeline together. Uh, but right now, uh, I'll focus is on the search and rescue and saving lives. We're happy that the individuals on the vessel uh, seem to be okay, but there are folks in that water that we need to find. So the White House is saying, Mayor, that they're willing to offer assistance in this case. What kind of help might you need? Well, listen, we, 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 I, I've had direct contact with uh, Secretary Buttigieg and members of the White and, and the president's staff. We're very grateful. We'll be reaching out to them for every single kind of asset that we may need. We already have support, obviously, uh, from the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. But as we go through uh, this tragedy and as we go through uh, the phases, uh, once we get through search and rescue and uh, looking at how we can uh, get the debris and all of the things out, how we can work uh, with in tandem to get our poor and all the things back open, uh, we'll be making every single ask that we can of our wonderful federal partners. Uh, but right now, all of our asks are about the search and rescue. And, Mayor, have you spoken to either the president or anyone in the Biden administration this morning? Yes, I have, actually. I, yes, I have spoken uh, to members of the Biden administration. Like I said, I spoke to Secretary Buttigieg directly uh -huh. and Tom Perez, who works directly uh, uh, for the, the president at the White House. And, you know, this was such a massive bridge. It happened in a matter of just moments. It also happened, notably, at the nation's ninth busiest port. Can you talk us through the impact on the area? Yeah, listen, this, the port, everyone depends on this port, right? Mm -hmm. It's a huge, huge thing for us. We know how important the port is, but right now it's not as important as those lives, and that's where my focus is. And the focus, obviously, in the air and in the water right now, can you... Talk a bit about the scale of this rescue operation. Uh, it's a big scale. You're talking about dive teams from uh, multiple police departments, multiple uh, fire departments, state agencies that have a uh, dive team support out here. Everybody's working uh, to find these individuals uh, to make sure that we are, are leaving nothing unturned in our search. And, you know, Mayor, there have been some challenges overnight because this happened around 1.30. Yeah. Uh, we kept hearing about, you know, darkness being a huge obstacle for search and rescue teams who were there on scene. Do we know when those two people were rescued? Was it after the sun came up? No, they were they were rescued before the sun came up, and uh, even though we know there's challenges uh, presented by the by the darkness, uh, we have to make sure that we're using all of our assets 
Uh, we use our helicopters to aid our divers and our teams. We were able to use sonar. That's how we know that there's vehicles in the water. Uh, so we'll use every asset and every piece of technology and equipment that we have while understanding that when you not just have the darkness, now the sun is up, that helps, but you still have the current, you have the, the depth of the water, you have the weather itself, uh, the temperature of the water, all of those things present challenges, and we just have to work through them as we go through search and rescue. Okay, Mayor Brandon Scott, thank you so much for making time to update us. We appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. And stay with us. We continue to follow this developing news from Baltimore. We want to take you now to our partners at CBS News Baltimore for more coverage. This morning, some tides that are here and also how cold that water is as well. So they're working to do that. In the meantime, we're going to be staying put right here in this area because we do know that there's going to be a conference here happening again around 930 this morning. We're hoping to hear from Governor Westmore as we are told that he is going from Armistead. That's across the bridge here to now over here. And we're going to talk about how this is no longer a loop for 695 for anyone to be taking. 895 and 95 is your best bet if you're going to be commuting this day. Reporting live, I'm Alexis Davila for WJZ. Okay, Alexis Davila reporting there for us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have, as I mentioned, a, a team of reporters are out there right now and have been uh, since this thing started very early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And now we want to go check in with Amy Kawada, who's been live in Hawkins Point on that end of the bridge all morning as well. Uh, what's the latest, Amy? Yeah, hey, guys. Well, we are still continuing to see... Uh, community members come out here to just kind of grasp what's happening. We've been seeing uh, many first responders arrive here throughout the morning. We are still about a mile away uh, from the key bridge here. We are um, at Fort Armistead Road where you can see uh, they are still blocking off this entrance. I'm uh, assuming this is going to be blocked off for quite some time now. We're told that uh, crews will be out here for several hours, over 8 to 12 hours uh, as they are out here uh, focusing on recovery efforts. Right now they're trying to rescue you as many people as we can uh, they can uh, we were told at last check at 6 30 the number has fluctuated throughout the morning uh, but right now upwards of seven people uh, in the water we were told two people have been rescued one person who refused treatment and is expected to be okay another who was taken to a local trauma center uh, in serious condition again that was at last check at 6 30 no update on if any more uh, people have been rescued but of course we are expecting to hear in about an hour or so an update and hopefully that number uh, of people rescued has gone up uh, but that is the main focus right now we've seen helicopters in the air we've seen uh, rescue crews with boats come in from Howard County and Arundel County Baltimore City Baltimore County just such a massive response here this is uh, such a large uh, footprint and they are really working against time right now uh, some things that are working against them though the rising tied uh, in assisting in these search and rescue efforts. But uh, one thing to note is that uh, the sun is now out, so it's helping crews uh, look into the water. They were battling this uh, in the darkness for several hours this morning as this unfolded around 1.30 this morning. Uh, but we did uh, hear from a lot of community members who came out here, some even in tears, just shocked because they say they it could have been them uh, traveling on this this very well-traveled key bridge here. Um, I spoke with another person who actually works for the Port of Baltimore who came out here and said he actually knew some people who were on the Dolly ship, uh, the cargo ship. Uh, they Fortunately, we were told at last check that everybody on that cargo ship uh, is expected to be okay, and they are in contact with the Coast Guard in communication. Of course, a lot of investigation uh, is set to be underway. This is going to be a long road ahead as far as search and rescue efforts and just recovery efforts as well. Uh, but just the overall feeling here in community is just shock. Uh, really hard to take in those images and videos that we've been showing you throughout the morning. Um, and now that it's bright out, people are coming out uh, to just see for themselves. We can't, of course, see over here from where we're standing in particular, but uh, where Alex Glaze is, uh, just a few miles down the road, uh, people can see that image on their backyard, and it's just, it's really hard to take in. Um, so, of course, we're continuing to see people make their way through here, emergency personnel. Um, 
Other people are being asked to avoid this area of 695 and take alternate routes. Of course, we will continue to stay on top of this story for you guys and bring you any developments as soon as we learn more, both on air and online on WJZ.com. But for now, reporting live, I'm Amy Kawada for CBS News Baltimore. Amy, thank you very much. This, of course, the, this waterway, this bridge is very personal to a number of people, uh, including those who, who use it for recreation as well as for commerce, as we see right there. Marty, this is personal for you, too. Oh, it's very personal. I've been a, keep it in mind, I'm a pleasure boater. Let's so make no mistake about that. I don't captain large freighters, tugboats, or big vessels. I'm a pleasure boater. But as you pointed out, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pleasure boaters on the Chesapeake Bay who routinely go under the key bridge one way or the other. It's the quick way to take friends and those visiting from out of town into the inner harbor. It's the main exit ramp to the beauty shot of Baltimore, Maryland. And I can give you the lay of the land. It's actually very flat and very safe, very well maintained. The, the key bridge is about 185 feet above the water, the roadway above the water. For comparison, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge is 186 feet. So not much. Not much. They're about the exact same size, but much different in length. If we go to the harbor cam shot, you can see the series of buoys that lead commercial vessels out. If you look just below the center line of your TV, you'll start to see on the left and right side a couple of small black dots. You'll see one set moving toward the vessel. You'll see another set. And then if you look beyond the dolly and the remnants of the key bridge, you'll see two more. It is basically a slot car track. The channel is about 51 feet deep and about two and a half football fields wide. It's well regulated. Now, the dolly, according to the specs I have found on the internet, is about half a football field wide. Mm -hmm. So you would think, well, there's not a lot of room for variance there, and there is not. That is why you have a qualified captain and a bay pilot. Mm -hmm. Bay pilots have been helping navigation on the Chesapeake Bay since 1852. I believe it's the oldest state association of pilots in the United States. A bay pilot will be with a vessel coming from Norfolk to Baltimore or beyond or going in the opposite direction as long as you're on the Chesapeake Bay. Now we're talking about someone actually at the helm. So right? Someone Driving standing next to the captain right. issuing the commands. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they're highly trained, highly respected members of the maritime community on the Chesapeake Bay in the country and worldwide. So it's not like someone was talking about opening day or a, a Ravens season upcoming or the draft, they're paying specific attention to what they are doing. Leaving the Seagirt Terminal, it's very simply a matter of getting on the expressway that is the channel. You, if I was to take Cena, you or Vic out on the boat, where do you want to go? You want to go to Rock Hall, you want to go to Wharton Creek, you want to go to Annapolis, and we just head out. It's not that way with large commercial vessels. It's a series, if you want to compare it to, and a series of interstate highways. You go to a certain point, the Baltimore Channel, the Brewerton Channel, mm -hmm. the Craig Hill Channel, and you take specific routes up and down the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. And they're marked, very well marked, by a series of buoys. So it's, it's I don't want to say it's an easy ride, but it's a well marked, well navigated way in and out of the port of Baltimore. Given the, the safety measures you're talking about here, mm -hmm. uh, the pilot and uh, the captain, uh, it's clear, at least from the information we've gotten, that there's something catastrophic must have happened on board there because, as you know, you can't stop that ship on a dock. And you've been listening in on continuing coverage from CBS News Baltimore on some developing news this morning, a massive bridge that collapsed in Baltimore overnight. More on this story after the break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News.
Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did any, any of that make what sense? Have you What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future, now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh my god. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating trash. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CBS. And we continue to follow some breaking news from Maryland this hour, where a cargo ship crashed into a major bridge. It caused the bridge to collapse, sending cars and people flying into the water. Our coverage continues now with CBS News Baltimore. They're well maintained. They're well monitored. They're well policed. Do they come through one at a time uh, under the bridge, or can there, since you're saying that the, the space is wider, is it more than one ship that goes through back and forth at a time? I, I believe it's okay. one. It's one at a time. One at a time, yeah. But we have a lot of we have a lot of of goods going in and out of the Baltimore Harbor. Yeah. We really, honestly, do. So there's nothing willy nilly about this. Sure. And I, as I keep looking at video of the ship. I'm not unsure that a stern anchor hasn't been dropped right now to keep the vessel from moving the drag right, and causing, causing even a little more damage. Just imagine, folks, we used to call them slot car tracks. But, for instance, on our desk here, mm -hmm. there's a piece of plexiglass, piece of plexiglass with a little channel in between. That's what it looks like, 51 okay. feet. But on either side of those buoys, it goes very quickly to maybe, you know, 10, 15 feet deep. Right. So I imagine at some point, I'm not sure the vessel actually got out of the channel, right. but if it would have, it would have started plowing through mud, which may have helped to slow it up. But I'm pretty sure it was staying within the channel. Okay, stay with us here for a moment, Marty. We've got Cody Butler from the Baltimore Banner who is joining us now. Of course, our, 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 our partner here uh, at WJZ and uh, they have reporters on this story and have been for uh, most of the, the, the night as well. Cody, uh, are, you, are you there?
Okay, well, I guess we'll be coming to them a, a little bit later. Uh, okay, they're trying to get to, to Cody right this very moment. Uh, so, Marty, uh, you obviously have been in, uh, on that many times, channel, channel many, many times. times. Just um, to the just to the um, west side of where the bridge is damaged is where the Francis Scott Key buoy is. Right. It marks where Francis Scott Key was held by the British during the bombardment of Fort McHenry. It's an incredibly popular tourist destination. It's a beautiful buoy. It's called conical because it looks like a cone. It's very tall. It's got to be 20 feet tall, red, white, and blue. So you have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, pleasure boat traffic there, but here's where I'm pointing out. How well is the channel marked? As you come under the key bridge, there are a series of two lights that you're looking at as you're coming into the harbor of Baltimore. They're called range lights. Mm. They are at Fort McHenry. And when one goes on top of the other, you know you are going right at Fort McHenry and you are right in that channel. There's very little left to the imagination if you are paying attention. And these bay pilots, these captains pay absolute, sure. the bridge crew themselves, there's more than two or three people on that bridge. They're paying absolute attention. Okay. We've got Cody now. Let's see where we are. Cody with the Baltimore banner. What do you have for us? Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, like you said, we have been on this all morning, as I'm sure every news organization in the state has, right? I remember, um, you know, we the news happened, what, around 1.30 a.m.? It was... Just before 4 a.m., I get the phone call from the editor-in-chief that says, hey, the, the key bridge collapsed, and that's all you can remember, really. And then you, you jump right out of bed, you start making calls, you start rallying the troops. So we have folks on both sides of the bridge. We have folks headed to Fort McHenry. I'm sorry, Cody, continue. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, so, you know, we've, it's been an all-hands-on-deck situation for, for all of us uh, in, the, in the banner, both out in the field and here in the office. Um, you know, trying to track what might happen at the port, what might happen with the federal and state officials. Um, it's, it's truly just unimaginable, right? If you hadn't seen the video, you wouldn't believe it. Cody, uh, where are your reporters right now? What, what, uh, what are the areas that they are covering right now uh, and, and, and mm -hmm. trying to, to, to gather more information on? Yeah, a little bit of everything, right? We have people on the ground uh, trying to get into the port to see what sort of boats might still be around. We have people on both sides of the bridge uh, where there have been various staging areas from state and local officials. I believe we have someone headed to Fort McHenry just to kind of keep an eye on things. Um, and back at the office and, and remote, you know, we have people uh, contacting uh, marine construction officials to see what sort of timeline we might be looking at. We're trying to uncover and unpack the economic impact. And, there are really so many threads for us to untangle here, and I'm, I'm sure it'll continue to be an all-hands-on-deck situation for the banner, for WJZ, for, for everybody around the city for a long time. Okay, Cody, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. And, of course, I'm sure we'll be communicating back and forth over a period of time about this very important story that has affected the entire region. Absolutely. Take care. Yes, sir. We'll see you soon. Uh, Senator Ben Cardin. Yes, we um, have. Senator Ben Cardin on the, line. on the line right now to, to talk with us. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for joining us here this morning. Uh, this obviously is uh, going to be devastating to you as well. Oh, it's absolutely tragic. It's, uh, it's horrible. First, the rescue, we hope that uh, we can minimize any of the casualties. Uh, it's just horrible. Uh, when you take a look at the video, the Port of Baltimore is now closed. Ships are being stranded. Uh, we have transportation issues. Uh, it, it is uh, a lot of to, to try to digest. Uh, I was in conversations with Secretary Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, they are making all resources available. The Coast Guard is activated in regards to the rescue. The Army Corps is going to be working on uh, how we can get the, the channel open as quickly as possible. Uh, so it is a, a situation where the local officials will be working with our federal officials to do everything we can uh, to deal with this tragedy. Um, Senator, of course, uh, right now the emphasis is obviously on rescue and uh, recovery, uh, but I, I would imagine that you've already put things into motion. You mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers uh, looking at when they can get this channel open, and it, we know this is, needs to happen and needs to happen quickly uh, right after the rescue effort's underway, correct? You're, you're exactly right. The first priority is rescue. 
uh, and that has been underway since the tragedy occurred. And they will continue to do that until they have completed that mission. Once that mission is, is completed, we have to be able to implement as quickly as possible the most effective way to open up the Port of Baltimore, uh, which is critically important to our commerce. There are ships, ships that are stranded right now. And uh, in the meantime, we will de be dealing with the surface transportation, uh, which is going to present a lot of challenges for us. And, Senator, we've discussed the widespread impacts of this, of course, namely the families of those currently in the water. What do you want to say to those uh, family members and just all of those people impacted this morning? Well, our prayers are with the, the families. We, we recognize the uncertainties. Uh, we, we, the, the search teams are out doing everything they possibly can to rescue. Uh, we will. All right, we're following some breaking news this hour out of Maryland. The catastrophic bridge collapse in Baltimore. Again, we've been following this story as it happened. It broke overnight. You're watching our coverage from CBS News Baltimore. We'll take a quick break. More on this coming up. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land this power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I'm a voracious consumer of information and news. I am constantly curious and constantly want to learn. I know I personally want to know the basic facts of every issue and to press into the heart of the matter. Information is the currency of democracy, and that's what we bring to the table every Sunday. We are following breaking news this hour out of Maryland. 
the catastrophic bridge collapse in Baltimore. You're looking right now at live pictures of what's left of the span of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Cameras caught the moment when a cargo ship slammed into this bridge just before 1.30 this morning. The impact sent sections of the structure tumbling into the water. An eyewitness shared what they saw. I wanted to know what the bang was. Ship hit the key bridge, sinking. The bridge is gone. So officials say two people have so far already been recovered from the water, one in serious condition. And Maryland's governor has also declared a state of emergency. I'm Chanel Call in Studio 57, and we begin this hour with our Nicole Skanga, who's on the ground near the site of this collapse. Nicole, good morning. What's the latest there? Good morning to you. A very active search and rescue operation currently underway, and fire officials are searching for as many as seven people who plunged into the water during that collision at approximately 1.30 a.m. They are searching in waters as deep as 50 feet. Video captures the terrifying moment a container cargo ship plowed into a massive column supporting the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Moments later, you can see flames and thick plumes of smoke coming from the ship. Then the section of the bridge starts to crumble before collapsing into the Patapsco River below. The entire bridge, the entire key bridge is in the harbor. The Baltimore City Police Department said only part of the 1.6 mile long bridge collapsed. Video shows multiple cars driving on the bridge at the time. They could not confirm how many, but did say there was at least one the size of a tractor trailer. They were workers. That was their vehicles. They were pouring concrete. Baltimore police say there is a possibility construction workers on the bridge may have fallen into the river. Rescue teams are looking for up to seven people who may be in the river along with an unknown number of vehicles. Water temperatures at the time were 48 degrees, putting anyone in the water at risk for hypothermia. This water is, is, is current uh, influenced. So right now we think the tide is coming back in. That adds a bit of a challenge to us also. We wanted to know what the bang was. Ship hit the key bridge, sinking. The bridge is gone. An official with the Coast Guard in Baltimore confirmed the 974 foot long and 161 feet wide Singapore flag cargo ship called the Dolly collided with the bridge. It was headed to Sri Lanka. Never would you think that you would see physically see the key bridge tumble down like that. It looked like something out of an action movie. And we know that the container cargo ship was headed to Sri Lanka and it weighed more than 155,000 tons. Chanel. And Nicole, you know, we can see this crush of cameras behind you here. I know you're at this media checkpoint just steps away from the bridge. Can you tell us what else you can see from your point of view? Yeah, well, behind me, you might see uh, media descending on this spot here. We're told that we're going to be briefed by officials, including uh, potentially the Maryland governor in the hour. And so right now, uh, a lot of press here lining up. We can also see police vehicles. I saw state police. I've seen Baltimore police, Baltimore County police, uh, you know, over behind my right shoulder and then beyond here to the bridge. There is just this massive rescue operation underway and right now officials tell me that is still very active. They are still searching for as many as seven individuals in the water. Uh, also confirming to CBS News that they have pulled two individuals out of the water earlier today. Fire officials did that. One is uninjured. One was transported to an area hospital for treatment and is in serious condition. And Nicole, I know right now the priority obviously on the search and rescue efforts, but there are also big questions about how this may have happened. You know, when you look at the video, this massive bridge coming down in just a matter of seconds, what are officials there saying about what may have led to this? Yeah, following this collision, there were a flurry of law enforcement memos, including one 
from CISA, the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, issued to law enforcement and obtained by CBS News. That bulletin saying that the U.S. Coast Guard had reported that the Dolly, the cargo ship, lost propulsion as it was leaving Baltimore Harbor, and that vessel notified the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of the vessel and an elision or a collision with the bridge was possible. And so we're just learning this new information from law enforcement from the Department of Homeland Security that the U.S. Coast Guard uh, had become aware of reports from the Dolly indicating that they had lost propulsion of that motor ship uh, and that they knew that a potential collision was possible and that they had notified the Maryland Department of Transportation as much. Yeah, this is really key information. Officials also saying there's, quote, absolutely no indication this was intentional. Nicole Skanga, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Meantime, Maryland's Transportation Secretary and the U.S. Coast Guard gave an update earlier this morning on the state's rescue efforts. At this time, this is an active search and rescue mission. We know there were, we know there were individuals on the bridge at the time of the collapse working on the bridge, contractors for us. Our partners from the U.S. Coast Guard will provide some more information momentarily. In terms of traffic, drivers should avoid I-695 Southeast Corridor and use I-95 and I-895 as alternatives. I-695 is being detoured southbound at exit 43, the Peninsula Expressway, and northbound at exit 2, Route 10. Vessel traffic into and out of the port of Baltimore is suspended until further notice, but the port is still open for truck trans trans transactions. Obviously, we're very thankful for the first responders who are carrying out their efforts in these rescues and that, that, they're, that they're doing this all through the night and today. And we're praying, obviously, for everyone's safe return. The Coast Guard's primary mission right now is search and rescue, looking for any survivors in the water. On scene, we currently have three small boats. We also have Coast Guard Cutter Mako, an 87-foot patrol boat. We have a helicopter from Air Station Atlantic City, and we're working with numerous federal, state, and local partners on scene on these search and rescue efforts. And the Biden administration has been briefed on the collapse. For more on the White House's response, let's bring in CBS News political correspondent Caitlin Huey Burns. Uh, Caitlin, thanks for joining us. What was the big takeaway from the administration's response today? Hey, Chanel, good to be with you. As you mentioned, the president has now been briefed by officials on the bridge collapse and the ongoing search and rescue efforts. Uh, the top line coming out from uh, uh, White House officials to reporters is that they have no indication of any nefarious intent. Now, the president has been briefed, as we say. White House officials tell us that they are closely coordinating with uh, the Maryland governor. We have also heard from the transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, saying that his his team is in close contact and coordinating with uh, the state of Maryland and the governor and transportation agencies there. Uh, the president's uh, team says that their hearts go out to the families and they have also uh, employed the U.S. Coast Guard, as you saw from that briefing, uh, to conduct the search and rescue efforts here. And Caitlin, you know, earlier this morning I spoke with Baltimore's mayor. He said he's also been in touch with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. What kind of federal help might officials be able to offer here? That's right, and, and this is a lot of interagency uh, work with the local agency as well. Uh, you know, the, the governor declared, the governor of Maryland declared a state of emergency in Maryland, and the uh, White House has said that they are uh, ready and willing to offer any sort of federal assistance that they may need. Oftentimes, uh, states of emergency is declared by governors uh, kind of prime the state for that uh, request of federal assistance. So we will wait to see uh, what comes out of that. We do know that uh, Governor Wes Moore is on site. His office uh, put out a photo of him surveying uh, the, the, the wreckage from that uh, collapse. He's expected to talk later uh, this hour. Okay, lots to follow here. Caitlin, thanks for the update. Officials in Baltimore say the daylight has been critical for search and rescue efforts there. Earlier this morning, I spoke to the city's public information officer about the challenges they face ahead. 
We do have our uh, dive and rescue team um, deployed. Uh, as we have come into daylight right now, we uh, will begin to reassess and uh, determine exactly how we will most accurately and efficiently be able to uh, assess and identify who we have in the water, where these victims are, and how we'll best be able to get uh, to them. Um, we will be utilizing sonar um, equipment as well as infrared equipment to be able to identify their uh, are. So we have quite a bus this morning. Okay, and we know two people so far have been rescued. Seven potentially or more are still being searched for. Any updates on those numbers right now, Kevin? Actually, those numbers uh, remain the same uh, as I speak right now. And again, uh, the fact that we have daylight right now will better aid us in our ability to uh, be um, uh, successful, hopefully, and, and being able to identify and locate where these victims are. As uh, I'm not far from the water's edge, and I can see that there is um, a fair amount of a current coming through here. So the fact that this tide's coming through could certainly take those individuals' uh, bodies uh, away from where they initially may have gone into the water. So we have a few challenges ahead of us, but we have our dive rescue team members who are the, the most experienced and uh, efficient in and, and performing these types of tasks. So we're going to be relying heavily on them and their expertise. And, you know, Kevin, these images obviously just so dramatic. The devastation is so widespread. I'm wondering whether there are any further structural concerns for folks who are there, part of the rescue team on the ground and in the water. Well, certainly we are operating cautiously uh, with consideration that this uh, bridge has collapsed. So um, there's only so close that we'll be able to get to uh, these structures uh, with consideration that, hey, this bridge has just come down and we want to alleviate and avoid any adverse um, operating conditions for our, our rescue team members. And stay with us. We'll continue to follow this breaking news of a massive bridge collapse in Maryland. We'll show you this dramatic footage and update you on the search for people in the water. Plus, we'll have a live update from officials later this hour. Stay with us. More on this straight ahead. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression, Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Slammed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge earlier this morning, sending sections of that structure tumbling into the water. Take a look. So far, two people have been rescued. Joining us now from Baltimore with more on this story, CBS News Philadelphia reporter Wakisha Bailey. Wakisha, thanks for joining us. You know, we've been hearing stories all morning of people saying they woke up, they heard this really loud boom in the middle of the night. What have you heard from people on the ground? Yeah, I mean, exactly just that, that loud boom sending everyone into shock. How could something like this happen? And as you saw in the video, this collapse happened in a matter of seconds. This happened about 1.30 in the morning. A lot of times this is just people going to work. And then who would have ever thought that something like this could happen? Talk to us, Wakisha, about the history of this bridge, what it means for the community, and how commuters there may have been impacted. Yeah, well, right now, this is a main bridge as also a gateway into Baltimore. And this is huge for the commerce for the state of Maryland. More than 32,000 people travel across this bridge every single day. So you can only imagine the ripple effect that this could have. Now, with this being a port, this means that now all of these ships are going to have to be redirected into other ports in neighboring areas. So there's going to be a lot of delays with packages. And as far as just regular people that use this bridge on a day-to-day -day basis, this also means for them that this could be almost 8 to 12 months we're hearing before this bridge is even remotely close to being fixed. Right, because the priority right now is search and rescue. But after that is over, obviously, crews will have to deal with the massive cleanup. You mentioned this happened at, by the way, the ninth busiest port in the nation. I wonder if you can just quickly update us on operations there. And you were talking a bit about the impact this could have on the East Coast. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's just that. Um, here it is with this being such a busy port. That means that there's going to be a lot of ships backed up. So mm -hmm. now they have to find other ways to reroute. Now, we have been trying to get information from, uh, you know, the head of transportation. But right now they say that their main focus is really looking for survivors. Now, as far as the individuals on that ship that did crash into this bridge, we are told that they are all accounted for. However, officials are still looking for seven people. Two were rescued, and one of those people are in serious condition. Okay, lots to follow here. Wakisha Bailey, thanks for the update. And we will, of course, continue to follow this developing story from Maryland. We're expecting an update from officials at 9.30 this morning. So in just over 10 minutes, we'll bring you there live as soon as that begins. To some other news we're following this hour, the Supreme Court will hear arguments today in a new abortion case that could impact women across the country. The conservative-leaning court is set to decide if access to the so-called abortion pill should be limited. CBS chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford has more. Jan, good morning. Well, good morning. So, I mean, this case could really have far-reaching implications. Mifepristone, the, the drug at issue, is used in nearly two-thirds of all abortion. Now, the right to abortion itself is not the issue here, but whether the FDA overstepped when it made the pill easier to get. My body, my choice. Two years after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, I want the day! 
issue of abortion is back at the high court. The Supreme Court is weighing whether the Food and Drug Administration adequately considered safety when it expanded access to the pill. In 2016, the FDA extended the window women can take mifepristone from 7 to 10 weeks. And during the pandemic in 2021, it said an in-person doctor's visit was not needed, allowing mail-order pharmacies to ship the drug nationwide. Critics say those changes compromise women's health and want regulations back to how the pill was prescribed for the first 16 years it was in use. This case is about safeguards for women who choose to take abortion drugs. If women are going to take abortion drugs, then they should have adequate and common sense protections. Abortion rights groups disagree and say mifepristone is safe. This case is just a blatant effort to further restrict abortion access nationwide. The case comes at a critical time, with abortion access a key issue in the presidential election. Last week, former President Trump suggested he would support a national ban around 15 weeks, while President Biden vowed this. We will restore Roe v. Wade again as the law of the land. Now, if the court rules against the FDA, it would restrict access to that drug even in states where abortion remains legal. We are expecting a decision by the end of June. Chanel? Thank you. And for more on this, I want to bring in CBS News campaign reporter Shauna Mizell. She joins us on the phone right now. Shauna, what's really at the center of this debate, and what can we expect to hear come out of this discussion today? Good morning. So at the center of this debate is whether the FDA acted correctly in rolling back regulations surrounding NEPA Pristone. Those regulations included allowing the drug to be mailed and also, you know, lessening the requirements for who could prescribe this drug. They allowed nurse practitioners instead of doctors to be able to prescribe NEPA Pristone. But first, the justices will have to determine if the group who brought this lawsuit had legal standing to bring a lawsuit against the Food and Drug Administration. What we'll be expecting to be hearing today will be surrounding those arguments. Do we have a sense, Shauna, of how the court might lean on this issue? You know, I think that really remains to be seen, but the Biden-Harris campaign held a press call yesterday where they sought to highlight that three of the justices that will hear arguments here today were appointed by former President Donald Trump. They underscored that this is the same court that overturned Roe versus Wade, and they really sought to emphasize the wide-ranging implications that could be had on access to abortion nationwide, depending on how the justices go on this. Mm -hmm. Some notable points there. Shana Mizell, thank you. Thank you. And still ahead this hour, more on this morning's breaking news, the bridge collapse in Baltimore, which sent people and vehicles plunging into the water. More on this story just ahead. We'll be right back. Shiny faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen. Because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. President, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else.
this case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you have one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. And welcome back. You're looking live at what's left of the Francis Scott Key Bridge near Baltimore, Maryland. The bridge collapsed earlier this morning after it was struck by a container ship. This was a moment of impact at around 1.30 a.m. Eastern this morning. Take a look at this dramatic video. Search and rescue crews are working now to recover those believed to have been driving on the bridge when this happened. Earlier, I spoke with Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott about this massive effort. This is not just a city of Baltimore effort. I just uh, was on site. Uh, our governor came on site uh, to the search and rescue. Uh, everybody's working together, city, state, uh, federal folks, local folks, uh, county folks are here supporting my good uh, friend and colleague, County Executive Oshetsky, who has been with us. Everybody's working together. And one witness in the community woke up to the sound of this collapsed bridge. I spoke with him earlier about what he saw and heard. We were awakened by what sounded like a rolling thunder coming through, and it felt like an earthquake. When the bridge came down, it did uh, crash into the water, and it made uh, quite a noise, and it did create a, a vibration that went through the community. This community where I live is the closest community to the bridge, so it's actually right behind me. Um, and I had previously been a chief of operations in Baltimore City for the fire department. So I turned on my uh, radio and found out where the incident uh, was going on. And I, I went to the, to the scene where the command post was being set up to watch that uh, ensue. And um, uh, just got caught up into watching that. But as far as the impact, a lot of the people here can't get to work uh, over the Key Bridge. And they're going to have to take detours uh, several miles out of their normal route. I just wonder, especially because of your experience with the fire department, Donald, have you seen anything like this before? Uh, several times uh, we had a, a train explosion and derailment in the Howard Street Tunnel in downtown Baltimore uh, some years back, uh, and that created an um, uh, impact on the economic uh, ability of the, of the city. But uh, this this is a whole different animal, and um, yeah, very serious. It's it's, but it's something that we actually train for. We train for things like this, and the uh, multi agency response and the way the teams came together was very impressive. Very impressive. And can you talk about how the community is responding? I imagine you know it must be quite a frantic feeling to wake up and to see and hear about something like this, as you say, just down the road from your home. Well, we depend on the media to help us out and to tell us the uh, best routes to take uh, to uh, detour around the uh, the emergency up there. And um, I, I think the media's done a pretty good job on that, having you know been been through these experiences before. But the media played a, a big part in getting the information out to the folks who have to go to work. So uh, I think it's even though it's it's really a, a disaster up there. Uh, I think in, people are dealing with it uh, in a very reasonable way, responsible way, and in many ways the 
ways that we're trained to deal with things. And for more on this developing story, we want to bring back in CBS News transportation safety analyst Robert Sumwalt. He is also the former chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. Robert, we're glad to have you back. We also have some new information. We can now confirm the ship lost propulsion before crashing into the bridge. Explain what that means. Well, that pretty much um, uh, says a lot right there. The, uh, we can see from the video that the, uh, uh, that the lights of the ship blink out momentarily and then come back on before it collided with the, uh, with the pier or with the, uh, with the bridge piers. Um, the steering system on a, um, on a ship like this is hydraulically powered. And so when you lose electrical power, you're going to lose the, the hydraulics. Of course, the rudder is uh, hydraulically powered. So if they lost steering, if they lost power, uh, the ship really cannot be steered. So this explains a lot right there. So essentially, it sounds like this indicates this was likely mechanical error, not user error. Well, uh, that's what it sounds like. But there'll be a very thorough investigation. And the real question would be, uh, why, if this is the case, why did the ship lose electrical power? Uh, I mean, so why, why did that happen? That's not supposed to happen. So uh, was there a human error involved in that? And what kind of clues, Robert, might we get from both the ship itself and the surviving crew members? We got a lot of a lot of clues. Uh, certainly, uh, with the surviving crew, they're going to be able to give their firsthand account of it. There's a voyage data recorder which records a lot of parameters of the ship, like uh, the rudder angle and the uh, propulsion of the uh, of the ship. We'll have a voyage. The voyage data recorder also records audio, just like it would a, a cockpit voice recorder on a jetliner. So there'll be a lot of firsthand account of uh, what happened here and what the crew was uh, was experiencing. And Robert, we've been showing our viewers this really dramatic video all morning. You see this massive bridge coming down in just a matter of seconds. So I have to ask you about, you know, the question of infrastructure here. Should a bridge like this have been capable of withstanding a strike like that? Well, I think uh, when you're talking about a ship that has, has as much mass as this ship does, uh, it would be physically impossible to keep it from, uh, to keep, to design a bridge so that it can withstand that sort of a, uh, of a hit. So, Robert, which agency now is going to be leading the investigation into the official cause? What are the next steps here? So, it will be, um, the investigation will be conducted by both the NTSB and the Coast Guard. Which of those will lead, that's up to them to decide. If I had to guess right now, I would say that I suspect the NTSB will be the lead agency with the Coast Guard uh, uh, helping the NTSB. Okay, Robert Sumwalt, thanks so much for your time and your perspective. We appreciate this. And right, we're also we waiting to hear from officials live in Baltimore this hour. You can see our crews are set up. They're waiting for this to happen. We will, of course, take you there live as soon as it begins. To some other news we're following this hour, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are bringing their re-election campaign to North Carolina today. President Biden narrowly lost the state to Donald Trump back in 2020, and it's expected to be another highly competitive race this November. CBS News campaign reporter Aaron Navarro is in North Carolina awaiting the president and the vice president's arrival there. Uh, Aaron, thanks for joining us. What are you expecting to hear from Biden and Harris today as they make their general election pitch to voters in North Carolina? Hi, Chanel. Good to be with you. Health care. That's expected to be the main topic of the remarks later here in Raleigh, specifically with President Biden talking about the stark contrast uh, between his record when it comes to Medicaid, Medicare expansion, and uh, comments made by some House Republicans in terms of taking pre-existing conditions away or on uh, that topic. And in general, here in North Carolina, Medicaid expansion was recently passed and part pushed by Democratic Governor Roy Cooper, a Biden ally. So we're expecting to hear the president talk about that. And Vice President Harris, who will be joining him here in North Carolina, is expected to talk about reproductive rights, women's reproductive rights, uh, especially prevalent on the day that the Supreme Court begins their hearing, uh, hearing arguments about the abortion pill case. Aaron, why is North Carolina expected to be just so competitive this election? 
This was the closest state in terms of a Trump victory in 2020. He won by just over one percentage point. Democrats feel optimistic that they can flip it this time because of the changing demographics, not just when it comes to certain ethnicities coming in, uh, but in terms of younger people coming from more Democratic-leaning states. And Democrats have also cited uh, Mark Robinson. That's the Republican gubernatorial candidate that's made some polarizing comments, controversial comments in the past that they think uh, will bring Democrats out to vote up and down the ballot this November. And, you know, I just want to bring in some data here. In the North Carolina Democratic primary, more than 12 percent of voters supported a no preference option. Then in 2020, Biden, we know, lost the state to Trump by less than just two points. So what does he need to do here, Biden, to close the gap? Well, he needs as many Democratic votes as he can get. And you saw this happen in Michigan and Minnesota, kind of that uncommitted, uninstructed or no preference option gaining some steam. And it's really being led by progressive younger voters that Biden will need in his column if he wants even a chance to flip the state in November. And that's why you're seeing the Biden-Harris campaign. They put out a memo this morning uh, lumping in North Carolina with the battleground state of Georgia as their battlegrounds of the South, uh, noting the investments they're making here in terms of advertising, in terms of time spent, as they're looking to shore up that support on the Democratic base, as you mentioned, and then persuade those more moderate, independent Republicans in the suburbs around areas here like Raleigh. Okay, a key race we'll keep a close eye on. Aaron Navarro, thank you. Here's what else we're tracking this hour to keep you in the know. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu canceled a high-level delegation visit to Washington. This after the U.S. abstained from a U.N. Security Council vote calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. But Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is still expected to meet with his Israeli counterpart today. They're expected to discuss alternatives to a ground offensive of Gaza's southern city of Rafah. The U.K.'s High Court in London sided with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange this morning ruling he can appeal his extradition to the U.S. in a new hearing unless the U.S. can provide assurances that he won't be subject to the death penalty. The 52-year-old has been a British prison, in a British prison since 2019 and is wanted by the U.S. for leaking secret military files more than a decade ago. Federal authorities raided two of Sean Diddy Combs' homes in, Lo in Los Angeles and Miami. Officials confirm it's part of a possible sex trafficking investigation. It's not clear whether Combs was a target of the investigation. This comes months after a series of lawsuits accused the rap mogul of serious sexual misconduct. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill putting restrictions on minors using social media. The bill signed yesterday will ban accounts for kids under 14 and require parental permission for 14 and 15 year olds. It also directs the social media platforms to delete existing accounts of kids under the age of 14. This week marks one year since journalist Evan Gershevik was arrested on espionage charges in Russia. Coming up, we'll hear from his sister about the fight to bring him home. Plus, more on today's breaking news. The bridge collapse in Baltimore, which sent people and vehicles plunging into the water. Details on this straight ahead. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. 
the justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. We're continuing to follow breaking news out of Baltimore, Maryland this hour, where the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed overnight. Officials are expected to give us an update any minute now. The impact, though, of a cargo ship slamming into the bridge caused such devastation. Maryland is now under a state of emergency, and rescue efforts are still underway. And to some other news we're following this morning, a Russian court extended Evan Gershkovich's time behind bars once again. A judge ruling that the Wall Street Journal reporter must await his pre-detention trial in prison until at least June 30th. This comes as Friday marks one year that he's been held prisoner in Russia. 60 Minutes correspondent Leslie Stahl sat down with his sister. Take a listen to what she said about the moment she found out her brother was detained. I got a call from my mom, and uh, it's just my stomach fell out. You know, your heart stops. It's so hard to believe that something like that is actually real. And I remember my mom and I discussing the morning after, is that really Evan, that photo that came out? We didn't want to admit for a moment that that was him. And Leslie Stahl joins us now to speak more about that conversation. Leslie, thanks for being with us. I want to start with asking you why he decided to stay in the country after Russia invaded Ukraine, despite other Western reporters leaving, and how his family reacted to that? Well, first of all, he actually left and moved uh, to London, mm. but he was an accredited, I'm putting that in quotes, a Russian accredited American journalist. And he assumed because of that, that he'd be safe if he went back just to do his reporting. Obviously, he was wrong. Why is this case, Leslie, so unusual? Why has he been held there so long without a trial? Well, it's unusual because no reporters have been held, no American reporters, since the Cold War. Wow. And because he was accredited, uh, a lot of people thought that was kind of a shield of protection. Um, he's, when you ask about him being held so long, uh, we have an American um, ex-Marine Whalen, who's been held for five years. He's had a sentence of 16 years. 
and Brittany Griner was held, you know, the basketball player, for nine months. So, so far, one year seems to be the way these things go. You know, he did have this pre-detention trial today, and they extended his stay in prison before his trial. Absolutely no one we spoke to thought they were going to release him today. No one. So, Leslie, update us on what America's role is in this situation. What is the government doing to try to help him get out? And is an acquittal in Russia actually possible based on, you know, some of the other cases that you mentioned? Well, other cases usually end in a prisoner swap. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has been discussed. Uh, this is, this is a, a particularly difficult and emotional situation. You know, I've covered these hostage uh, cases for years going back to um, the 1980s. And up until very recently, families were advised not to say anything, not to raise the value of their loved one by giving a lot of publicity to the case. Um, Evan's situation is completely different. Um, the family uh, is being told they can do whatever they want, and they believe making him high profile is the right way to go. So does the Wall Street Journal, his employer. The United States has determined that he is wrongfully detained. And once that designation is made, um, the U.S. government is empowered to begin negotiating for him. And the U.S. government has an office within the State Department of Hostage Affairs, and they have been negotiating for him. They have discussed a prisoner swap. Um, Putin himself has, says he has said he's open to that, um, but uh, obviously nothing so far. And speaking of Putin, can you talk to us, Leslie, about the politics of this case? Well, you know, the Russians have been using hostages as a pawn for a long time. Um, they take them, they hold them uh, in these horrible prisons. Uh, and it, it is a, a pressure tactic to have us release uh, Russians who are in our prisons for actual crimes. Now, our, we maintain that a lot of the people they hold, like Brittany and Evan, are innocent of these charges that they're making. And uh, so uh, Putin suggested, this is very almost bizarre, that a deal involving Alexei Navalny, you know, the activist mm -hmm. who died or was killed in prison, that a deal was in the works to release him in a prisoner swap for Evan and others, and that it fell through when Navalny died. Um, the U.S. says, we don't know anything about that. I, we don't know what he's talking about. So uh, there's a lot of mystery obviously, involved in this particular case. Yeah, still so many questions. Leslie, looking forward to that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the first commercial flights from Haiti since gang violence erupted earlier this month landed in Miami on Monday. Haiti's Sunrise Airways and Global X Airlines both joined together to bring two flights out of the embattled Caribbean nation, carrying about 155 passengers in total. It feels really good to be here. <laughs> it feels really good to be here. And now I can go back to my family. I hope uh, the government will be able to uh, do something quickly because this situation is not, it's not, a, it's not a beautiful situation right now. We have seen violence in the past, but it's the first time we got to that point. We are left aside, we are left behind, and we see the way that uh, the Americans, they handle other issues. And for more on these evacuation flights is Tanya Francois from CBS News Miami. Good to see you. You know, I just want to start with asking you, Tanya, what you're hearing from people who got off the planes. Do we have any reaction from them? I mean, this was such a harrowing journey. You know, most of the people, when they get off these planes, they're, they're just asking for help. They're grateful, you know, to be back in the U.S. or to be on U.S. soil. But a lot of them are still wanting and longing for their home. Um, you know, imagine if you were here in the United States and you had to evacuate your home. You'd want whatever kind of help, you know, that, can, that you can get because it's still home, you know, to you. 
So while they're grateful, they're also sad at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we also know, Tanya, there are at least three other flights from Haiti set to land in Florida this week. Talk to us about who's getting on board those planes and whether there's anyone left who still needs help. Right. So a lot of those flights, they're, they're costing $979. So there aren't, they aren't just anyone, $979 U.S. dollars. So we want to make that distinction because Haiti's money is in the good system. And um, I don't recall the difference right now, but it's it's not a small difference. Um, and a lot of people who are getting on those flights are not U.S. citizens. And in a sense where they hold Haitian passports, they have visas. Some of them are part of the Biden humanitarian program. And you have about 90 days to get here, and Biden has been, President Biden has been having this humanitarian program since about January of last year. And they provide, if, if you have someone here in the United States, you can you can actually offer up someone to come here. Some of them are students and people who, again, already have visas and already have, have reasons to come to the U.S. You know, we have those free flights that the government, um, the United States government was offering from Cap Haitian also into the United States, but those were only for U.S. and American um, passport holders. And it's important to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to get on these flights for free because they, again, had their proper documentation and their proper paperwork. But for those people who were Haitian passport holders and had visas or, or students or reasons to be in the U.S., they could not get on those flights. So they're paying or finding or getting you know upwards of $1,000 one way average just to get here in the United States. Um, I flew to Haiti last week, actually, a week ago today, and we brought back um, on the missionary flight that I was on for um, Haitian passport holders who had a reason to be here for one reason or another. And so that flight was able to also, one of the first flights, to bring in um, Haitians, not Haitian Americans, actual Haitians back to the U.S. or to the U.S. Yeah, this is a really important distinction to make. So thanks for pointing that out, Tanya. Uh, recap us, though, on what's happening in Haiti right now. You said you just got back. Yes, yeah, so I got back a week ago on one of the first, or at least the, the crew said that was the first uh, mission, missionary humanitarian sort of a cargo plane. It was a DC-3 old World War II airplane. It was a very bumpy ride, um, but it was carrying about 5,300 pounds of cargo. And these were, um, you know, uh, the four, the three other missionaries who are, the three missionaries, because I'm not a missionary, I'm a journalist, who were on the flight with me were bringing back um, goods and essential items to help with the missions that they operate in Haiti. And um, there was uh, ramen noodles, there was rice, there was, um, I know, um, formula for kids, and there was peanut butter, just a lot of food and essentials um, that were needed, hospital supplies for some of the hospitals that they were running there. And one of the young men, his name is Meshach, who is a pastor who was who was on the flight with me. I checked in with him the very next day, and he says he went from trying to help to now feeling helpless. He says he had about a, a, a bag of rice for maybe 10,000 people. That's how bad the humanitarian issue there. Because the gangs are controlling the streets, movement around Haiti is restricted. So a lot of people can't leave. You know, Haiti has constant rolling blackouts. So people don't necessarily have, you know, a week's supply of food just stocked in the refrigerator. It's just almost day to day. People go out into these farmers markets, into, you know, the street vendors, and they purchase food for the day for the two days. I'm sorry. A desperate situation there. Tanya, thank you. Thank you. And still ahead this hour, continuing coverage of that bridge collapse in Baltimore, which sent people and vehicles plunging into the water. We'll be right back. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app.
Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. Happening now, officials are giving us an update on the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Let's listen live. We're doing everything in our power to rescue and recover the victims of this collapse, literally as we speak. People who, as we speak, are out there are divers, are air assets. People who right now are working to save lives and are doing it because the state asked. And we will update the public as the work continues. To our partners inside and outside of government, I know this has been a long night. We started coordinating immediately after the Key Bridge collapsed. We've been standing together every step of the way from our county leadership to our city leadership to our state leadership to our federal leadership. And I'm grateful to call each and every one of you not just colleagues, but I'm grateful to call you friends. And to the people of Baltimore, and each and every one of the 6.3 million Marylanders who call our state home, I recognize that many of us are hurting right now. I recognize that many of us are scared right now. And so I want to be very clear about where everything stands. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Our administration is working closely with leaders from all levels of government and society to respond to this crisis, and not but just by addressing the immediate aftermath, but also by building a state that is more resilient and a state that's more safe. That is our pledge, and that's our commitment, and we're going to keep that commitment. And lastly, to the victims of this tragedy and their loved ones. All of our hearts are broken. We feel your loss. We're thinking of you. And we will always be thinking of you. We pray for the construction workers who are on the key bridge. And we pray for everyone who has been touched by this tragedy and their families and all of their loved ones. But Maryland, we will get through this because that is the Maryland spirit, and that's what Maryland is made of. We are Maryland tough, and we are Baltimore strong. So in the face of heartbreak, we come together. We embrace one another, and we come back stronger. That's what we've always done. That's what we'll continue to do, and that's what we're going to get done together. And we're going to pray for Baltimore. And I'd like to turn this over to Senator Van Hollen, who's done a remarkable job in our fellow delegation in providing support. So thank you, Senator. Thank you, Governor. As the Governor said, we come together. We come together in Baltimore. We come together in Maryland. First of all, our hearts go out to all those who are on the bridge and their loved ones. We pray for them. Our gratitude goes out to the first responders who, as we speak, are out there continuing to conduct search and rescue operations. I want to thank the governor, the local, the mayor, the county executive, all the people gathered here as part of Team Baltimore and Team Maryland. And the federal government is with them as a partner. The Coast Guard, as we speak, is also part of this mission. Coast Guard cutters, Coast Guard aviation assets. I spoke uh, twice today uh, with Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg has pledged that they will do everything they can to very quickly release 
emergency response funds for this important project. The National Highway Transportation Administration Administrator is on his way to Baltimore if he's not here already. They will be releasing those early funds once all, all the parties are fully engaged. Second, the National Transportation Safety Board. I talked to the chair this morning. Uh, she and her team will be conducting an investigation of what happened. And finally, the Army Corps of Engineers, naval assets uh, for uh, looking uh, below the all of this is going to be covered. Uh, the governor uh, is leading Team Maryland, the mayor and the county executive, of course, Team Baltimore. Uh, but I'm just here to say, to, together with Ben Cardin, Senator Cardin, um, and Congressman Fumé and others, the federal government is your partner in this effort. Thank you, and again, to the people of our state and the people of this great city. We're with you. We love you. We will get through this together. Thank you, Governor. Good morning again. Uh, Paul Wiedefeld, Secretary of Transportation. Just a few updates uh, since our meeting this morning. Um, the, uh, the crew that was out there working was basically repairing potholes, just so you understand that. It had nothing to do with a structural issue at all at the, at the, in the facility. Um, at this time, one person has been uh, rescued and so far, and our, continue, our efforts continue in, in terms of that. Um, engineers are on site right now determining both some of the structural issues, obviously some of the debris field, and we'll start to work that, but we'll work hand-in-hand -hand with the NTSB before we take any further action in that area. With that, I did want to introduce the FBI for a few comments as well. Hello. My name is Bill Del Bagno. I'm the special agent in charge of the Baltimore Field Office. First and foremost, I want to say that our hearts go out to everyone that is impacted by this tragedy, especially the victims and their families. On behalf of the FBI, I would like to say that we are with you. We're with Baltimore and we're with the partners every step of the way. The FBI, on very first, looking at and assessing this matter from an investigative standpoint, I want to be clear that there is no specific or credible information to suggest that there are ties to terrorism in this incident. The FBI has been part of this response from the beginning. We uh, came within one hour to the command post and quickly latched up with our very strong partners all along the way. We will bring whatever resources that the FBI has to bear. We've already brought our crisis response, our victim services, and just recently our underwater search evidence recovery teams are on site. And we will continue to provide all those resources as long as it takes. And as the investigation goes on, we will take it to a conclusion along with our partners. To the pe people of Baltimore, to the public, I ask you to be patient as we go through this and as information becomes available to us. And lastly, I want to say thank you. Thank you to our partners. Thank you to ev everyone who um, in the FBI and counts on the FBI. We will always bring what we need to the people of Baltimore, and we are with you. I'd next like to introduce the Coast Guard. Good morning. The Coast Guard is still actively searching at this time. We are using response boat crews from two of our local Coast Guard stations, one of our Hilo crews from Atlantic City, and Cutter crews on one of our 87-foot patrol boats. We will continue to work with our local, state, and federal partners during this tragedy. Thank you. As far as you are aware, was the collapse of that bridge inevitable as that ship hit that part of the bridge? No, I mean, we're, we're still in the process of investigating exactly what happened. 
Uh, so we, we don't have any further details uh, about whether or not it was inevitable or not. There's no structural issue with the bridge? No, there was, uh, in fact, the bridge was actually fully up to code, so we have no further information about uh, what, was the, what, what happened during that time. Governor, is all shipping, is all shipping in and out of the port for. now stopped completely, and do you have any estimate very early on as to how long it will be before shipping can resume to the port of Baltimore? Yeah, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't have any estimates on timeline because right now our exclusive focus is on saving lives. Our exactly. exclusive focus is on search and rescue. Could you give us a better sense of the number? Because we've heard, I know Mr. Wiedefeld said one of them rescued, but earlier from Baltimore we heard that two have been rescued. Can you tell us the total number of people that have been rescued since the last call? Is it more than 50? Is it more than 100? Is it more than 200? What is it about that maybe that you're searching for and how many have been rescued? Well, we there are eight individuals, uh, six are being uh, searched for right now. One is that um, was taken to the hospital, and one is uh, not in the hospital that we're speaking to. So six unaccounted for? Yes. And does that involve individuals that may have been in vehicles that went in the water? Or is that just the construction? No. We believe it's a construction crew only. What about, what about so we don't think there's anyone in, in vehicles in the water? No, we do not believe so. Okay, we'll take questions right here. Take this question here. Governor, two questions. Quick, how quickly did you find out about what happened here, and what was your reaction when you heard the scale of what just occurred at that bridge earlier? Well, uh, I mean, I, it was, I think it was probably within minutes of, of, of everything, less than an hour, when I know that my phone first rang. Uh, and, you know, first from the, the mayor of Baltimore and also from our chief of staff. Um, and it was a... Uh, we know the key bridge. I've ridden over the key bridge countless times. So many of us know the key bridge because it is our normal commute. This is a place that is a normal commute route for over 30,000 Marylanders every single day. And so to hear the words that the key bridge has collapsed, it's shocking um, and heartbreaking. And immediately uh, the first thought and the first idea is go back. What happened to the people? Where we? What was the impact on on on, on human life? Um, but for every single one of us who are Marylanders, the words that the key bridge is gone, it it still shakes us because for over for 47 years that's all we've known. And so this is a uh, this is this is uh, not just not just unprecedented from what we're seeing and what we're looking at today. Um, it's heartbreaking. Governor, can you confirm you. that the crew on the ship uh, alerted authorities that it had lost propulsion and was in trouble? Uh, we, we can we can confirm that uh, that the, the crew uh, notified uh, notified authorities of a, of a power issue. Yes. And that they had lost power on the ship. Yes. Was there any ability to shut down the bridge? Or I think I'll take the question right here. Sorry. Total of eight, <clears throat> one rescued in the hospital, one uh, not in the hospital, but it is, uh, we have communicated with that person, and then six that we are searching for. And all construction workers working on the problem, with all eight of them? The, um, yes, they were all related to the construction program, yes. We heard that multiple vehicles went into the water. Any word on how many vehicles went into the water and the condition of those people that were in the vehicle? Not at this time. All right, we're going to shift over here. Was there any way to uh, shut down the bridge? Was there enough time for that distress call to trigger something like that? Uh, the, the thing that we know is that, uh, you know, even as the boat was coming in, you know, we had a ship that was coming in at eight knots. Uh, so coming in at a, at a, at a very, a very rapid speed. Um, we do know that uh, the investigation is, is, is currently going on. Uh, but I, I have to say I'm thankful for the folks who, who once the, you know, once the warning came up and once notification came up uh, that there was a May Day, who literally by being able to stop cars from coming over the bridge, uh, these people are heroes. They saved lives last night. They saved lives last night. Governor, Governor um, I, the focus is on rescue now and humanity. But looking forward, is there any vision for how long it could possibly take to remove the wreckage, to rebuild, and how it could possibly be done? Can you look into the future at all at this point? This is going to be a long-term build. 
it's going to be a bill that's going to require every asset in every aspect. One thing that I can tell you, we are going to get this done. We are going to make sure that that this is is not just not just rebuilt, but that we are going to rebuild in a way that remembers the people who this tragedy has impacted, and also do it in a way that uh, that honors the community uh, that it serves. But um, but right now, uh, I could not give you any form of estimate on timing or, or cost. Right now, uh, my and all of our exclusive focus is we're just trying to save lives. Can the mayor talk on the state of emergency locally, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, listen, we, we know the governor issued a state of emergency, but we at the local level uh, felt the need to do that too because there may be some things that we have to encumber with our fire department and other agencies that will be able to pull down support for as we all work together again as we're focused right now on saving lives and working through this unspeakable tragedy. In the, in the, in the interim, I know that there's obviously the focus is on the rescue and the recovery, but this is such an important thoroughfare here in Baltimore. For drivers, people trying to get around, how are they going to be able to manage while that is also going on? Yeah, so so we, we've also uh, already been in touch with people about alternative routes uh, and ways people can navigate uh, now this tragedy has happened. And I don't know, Secretary, if you want to speak to that as well. Just to give you a sense of scale, roughly uh, about uh, 35,000 people you know, a day use that facility. About double that use the Harbor Tunnel and double that again use the Fort McHenry Tunnel. So basically, we don't have those two other options. Uh, we'll, have, we'll make sure that we have as much uh, personnel out there to deal with any incidents, because as you know, that can cause the backups very quickly. And we will basically put out a lot of communication on different alternatives. We're also looking at transit alternatives as well. What role will the legislature play in this response? What role will the legislature play in this response? Are there any policies, any funds going to be freed up? Oh, yeah, no, so we're, we are, uh, in fact, you know, we have our, our Senate president here. We have members of the legislature here. The legislature is going to have a role uh, in all of this, as will our local elected officials, as will state officials, as will the federal government. Uh, is going to have a role in terms of how we think about the rebuild. Governor, how long do you expect shipping to be closed down through the port? Do you have any estimate that in terms of the, the port here? We, we, we don't at this point. But we don't at this point. Going in or out at this time. Correct. Yeah, we have, and we, do, we don't have we don't have an estimate on timeline as of yet. Uh, our focus really is right now on just making sure we're saving lives. One last question: Are they able to get out at all, or no? I'm sorry, say it again. The ships that are currently the vessels that are currently docked at the port are they able to get out or no? Um, you, the the one that's that's uh, captured under the is that, is that, is that still at port? Oh, yes, that one that one's still at port. Yes. We'll take one last yeah, question. One last question. Yes, uh, was the ship being guided out by tugs, firstly? And secondly, did you just say that it issued a May Day in enough time that you were able to stop all traffic from entering both sides so that the only uh, casualties we expect are the workers on the bridge? Yes, ma'am. So the investigation is still going on, so we're going to have all the full details uh, and also all the full details about the timeline and the TikTok that took place. But we're thankful that between the May Day and the collapse that, uh, that we had officials who were able to, to begin to stop the flow of traffic so more cars would not end up on the bridge. And, and I can there were some on the bridge or not? Were there any well, during others? the collapse. Yeah. Were there some on the bridge? There have been reports that have been sonar that have detected vehicles at the bottom of the water. So as well as the eight people, there could still be people trapped inside or potentially in vehicles. Is that correct? No, I think, well, the investigation is still going on. Uh, to find out exactly exactly how many people in what situation, but the thing that we do know is that uh, is that uh, many of the vehicles were stopped before they got onto the bridge, which uh, which which uh, saved lives in a, in a in a very very heroic way. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank we'll have another update Thank later. You. Thank this you. This is a huge detail. We don't know how Thank many vehicles. Okay, ninety five on time. Thank you. If you're joining us right now, we were listening live to officials in Baltimore update us on this huge bridge collapse that happened overnight. There is now a state of emergency there. So that's why we heard from a number of different agencies and a number of different people from levels of government. So the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, who we just saw there, he called this a crisis. The search for survivors is really important right now. It's a critical part of their mission. Authorities there are now saying they believe that six people that they're still looking for, they were people who were working to fix potholes on the bridge before it collapsed.
The FBI, on their part, is confirming they have no reason to believe that this was terror-related. As for next steps, the Fed say they will be working on quickly releasing emergency response funds to help the community that's been impacted by this. For more on this story, I want to bring in James Mercanti. He is the president of the New York Board of Pilot Commissioners. This is a state agency responsible for licensing and regulating boat pilots. He's also a maritime attorney. Thank you for being with us, James. Yeah, good morning, Chanel. Nice to be here. So we can now report, James, the ship lost propulsion before the bridge collapsed. Talk to us about what that really means and how a pilot might be trained to react to something like that. Well, what, what's going to depend is if, when you say loss of propulsion, whether it lost steering and power. If it lost steering and power, then basically it's a dead ship uh, just being carried by the current or its own, own momentum. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that at the, at the last second prior to the impact, you did see a big, big puff of black, real dark black smoke, mm -hmm. which, which, which could indicate, uh, Chanel, that uh, either power was restored at the last minute and the pilot was attempting to uh, make an emergency maneuver either by going full astern or by making a hard uh, hard left turn uh you know and, and it, so that that's going to be very interesting to determine whether or not uh they lost power and steering uh or um, and whether or not that was restored because uh, uh, we see that we see a lot of loss of propulsions here in new york harbor and the crew is usually fighting uh, feverishly uh, in the engine room to restore that power because without that propulsion, you're basically uh, uh, you're just being trying to maintain bare steerage way. And in a narrow you know channel like this, uh, where you could run aground on one side, hit a bridge on the other side, uh, your options are, are very limited. Uh, so uh, that's my observation of what I've seen so far. So, James, based on what we know and just given the speed and the size of this vessel, was there any other way this could have panned out? Uh, well, one thing that the pilots and the captains are trained to do in a, in a situation like this is, is to drop anchor. Mm. Uh, the ship has two, the two very huge anchors. Uh, the problem is that if you have momentum going forward and you can't go in reverse and you drop your anchors, you can end up running over your own your own anchor now you eventually may stop but you got to remember this is a this ship is three football fields long it's over 900 feet long and someone reported it was going about eight knots now eight knots is not a big speed in in, in an open area like that but um uh it, it it would take quite a while uh probably the length of you know five six football fields to bring that ship to a stop, even after dropping the anchors, because of its, if its power and momentum. And this is a behemoth. This is three football fields long. So, but typically, that's the only recourse that the pilots or the captains have is to drop their anchors. And I imagine if they didn't do that here, we don't know. We haven't heard any reports on that. There'd be a good reason uh, that they fig figured that 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 wouldn't wouldn't have uh, stopped the incident from happening. Plus, when you drop an anchor, usually the ship will start swinging. Uh, on its anchor, and instead of the bow hitting the bridge, you could have had the the stern of the ship hitting the bridge. So uh, there was really once they did a May Day, and obviously the May Day is a big big deal because if the pilots radioed a May Day, then there was a big mechanical failure, either loss of propulsion, steering, or both. And James, I don't know if we have the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Just given where we saw the ship had that moment where the lights were flickering and then where we saw that it actually hit the column and the bridge came down. In your assessment and in your, in your experience, would there have been time to put that anchor down? You all, it, it, and that would depend whether there was crew on the bow, right? Because the anchor was on the bow and that, and typically when ships get underway like this from a port, there's, there's, there is a bow watch person and the, and, and the NTSB, the Coast Guard will be looking at that. Was there someone on the bow? Was there crew on lookout? And if there is an emergency, they should be ready to deploy their anchors uh, in, in a second's notice. I mean, the, 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 the pilot or the captain radios the bridge, uh, excuse me, radios the bow. The crew member on the bow has his radio. They say drop anchor, and they would drop anchor. So that's going to be interesting to see uh, if that was looked at. And it also should be noted that you know, these ships have the the functional equivalent of a black box. And I haven't heard anyone talk about that yet, but 
All these ships, uh, these modern day ships have what they call a VDR, a uh, voyage data recorder. So everything that went on in that bridge, it verbally is recorded. And that of course will be studied very, very carefully. So they'll ha have to determine, well, when, when in the voyage, for example, did the ship experience a, a malfunction, whether it was power or, or steering? And that'll be determined because the voyage data recorder has a, has a, a time on it. So it'll be, it'll be second by second by second. So they'll know exactly when the May, May Day was radio. They'll know exactly when the ship lost uh, power or propulsion by, by, by what was going on on the bridge. And look, these pilots are very, very well-trained, very skilled pilots. They've probably done this voyage thousands of times. It's not a challenging uh, voyage. So what makes it challenging is what happened uh, on, the, on the ship. Uh, and, and as far as, you know, otherwise um, maneuvering under that bridge, even at night, is, 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 a, is a piece of cake for, for these skilled uh, Maryland pilots. And James, we know that you're also a maritime attorney, so I do want to ask you about what the liability in this might look like. Well, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be one heck of a case, and it's going to take a lot of attorneys for a lot of years to sort through all, all this with the, uh, not only the damage to the bridge, the damage to the ship, the, the casualties, there'll be, there'll be fatality claims, there'll be injury claims, there'll be you know, business interruption claims for the, 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 the bridge collapsing, the people that have to get to and from work, uh, the, the, the fact that commerce is stopping, no ships are going in, no ships are going out. There's gonna be a major salvage operation where they have to uh, remove the the remnants of the bridge is going to be a wreck removal, a salvage, and that's going to take weeks. And meanwhile, you have, you, you may have a cruise ship in there, or a cruise ship that was on their way in, and you know you're going to have so, so many charter party disputes as to you know that you know, it could be perishable cargo, uh, cargo delays. So the the, the 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 litigation, the maritime litigation here is going to be a textbook, like law school type case, and there's going to be major implications. And obviously, that's where. You know, these big ships have major insurance behind them, and uh, hopefully enough. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, James Mercanti, thank you. Thank you. We're keeping a close eye on the Supreme Court this hour as well throughout the day, as well as justices hear a major abortion pill access case. Coming up, we'll update you on what to expect from arguments today. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression, Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Welcome back. The Supreme Court is hearing arguments today in abortion case that could impact women across the country. The justices are set to decide if access to the widely used abortion pill, Mifepristone, should be limited. Joining me now for more on this is CBS News correspondent Natalie Brand. Natalie, you're standing by outside the Supreme Court this hour. What are you seeing and hearing from demonstrators there? Hi, Chanel. You can probably hear the demonstrators in the background. There are hundreds of them lined up outside the Supreme Court at this hour across both sides. I actually spoke to a group of young medical students, women who say that they're worried uh, about what the Supreme Court's decision could mean for their ability to practice medicine since they are studying to be OBGYNs. I also spoke to uh, a gentleman who's uh, opposed to abortion and anti one of the anti-abortion advocates who said that he really Really wants more oversight of this drug and really that's what's at the heart of this case Chanel. Yeah and the impact here could be really far-reaching. Talk to us about that. Yeah well this